on behalf of Walter Skluwer, a warm welcome to our attendees, speakers, and the panelists on this webinar under our Medical Edge series on World Anatomy Day, organized by the National Journal of Clinical Anatomy under the aegis of Society of Clinical Anatomists, SOCA, and Walter Skluwer. Our topic today is research in anatomical sciences, and we have a very distinguished speakers and panelists in today's session. Also, we'd like to mention that we'll be taking the questions at the end of the sessions in the webinar. And I request you to please post all the questions in the Q&A panel of this event. We'll try to address the maximum questions at the end of the respective sessions. Also, we'll be providing the e-certificates to all attendees of this webinar who will fill the event feedback form. So I request you to all please provide your feedback via link there, which we'll post in the session of the webinar. Now I request Dr. Pushpa to please introduce herself and just start the session. Dr. Pushpa, it's over to you now, ma'am. Ma'am, you are muted. Dr. Pushpa? Hello. Yes, you're audible, Dr. Pushpa. Uh, okay. A very good evening to the Honorable Chief Guest, invited dignitaries, guests, and delegates. On the auspicious day of Vijaya Dashmi, seeking the divine blessings of Almighty, I, Dr. Pushpa NB, Assistant Editor of NGCA, welcomes you all to this solemn and ceremonial event. If you have the knowledge, let others light their candle in it, says Margaret Fuller. NGCA always strives to enrich the knowledge of anatomists. In this regard, we have successfully organized three webinars on various topics. This is our fourth web webinar to commemorate World Anatomy Day with a focus to provide platform for synergistic academic interaction amongst anatomists from across the globe. On this occasion, we have renowned anatomists to embellish our event. First and foremost, I am absolutely delighted to introduce our dynamic editor in chief, Dr. Kumar Satish Ravi. Dr. Ravi is additional professor of anatomy from Ames Rishikesh. He has a distinction of being editor of Snell's Clinical Neuroanatomy, South Asian edition. He has worked in various capacities like subdean controller of examination in his institute. He is a distinguished researcher with illustrative academic career has more than 60 publications to his credit. Being passionate teacher, he has been conferred with Best Teacher Award, Best Researcher, and many awards for his contributions. I request our Editor-in-Chief to welcome this August gathering. Over to you, sir. Good evening to all my respected seniors, colleagues, and beloved students. Thank you so much uh, for being part of the World Anatomy Day being organized by Nathan Journal of Clinical Anatomy under the ages of Society of uh, Clinical Anatomists and being sponsored by the Walters Clover, which is a globally recognized uh, publisher. So first of all, I wish you all a very happy World Anatomy Day. When the country is celebrating uh, the Shahara, we, the clinical anatomists uh, of the country, gathered on this platform to observe this World Anatomy Day and to learn about the research in anatomical sciences. Uh, when we see the past in two, uh, 2019, IFA, that is the International Federation of Association of Anatomists, uh, declared to observe this World Anatomy Day on 15th of October, on the, uh, you say, the death anniversary of Andreas Vesalius. And this uh, Vesalius, he wrote a book, uh, which is popularly called as uh, the Fabrica, at the age of, you say, 29 years. And due to his immense uh, contribution in the field of anatomy, he is also known as uh, the father of modern human anatomy. So he was born uh, on 31st December of uh, 1514, uh, you say, and died on 15th of October in 1564. So in India, uh, for the first time, the Society of Clinical Anatomists uh, celebrated this World Anatomy Day in the year of uh, 2020. And we are continuing uh, to celebrate to convey 
the need of more research, you can say, and the development in the field of anatomy. So this uh, World Anatomy Day is different from the last World Anatomy Day, you can say, as I can say that it is uh, by the anatomist, for the anatomist, and of the anatomist. Because this time, even our chief guest is an eminent anatomist of the country, you can say. So being editor-in-chief of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy, it gives me immense uh, pride to welcome our chief guest, uh, Dr. Sudha Session, ma'am, who is honorable member of National Medical Commission of India. Apart from that, the vice chancellor of the Tamil Nadu, uh, Dr. MGR Medical University. And the most important, uh, she has been the former director, professor, and head of Institute of uh, Anatomy at Madras Medical College. So thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our request to be the chief guest on the World Anatomy Day in spite of your so uh, busy schedule, you can say. Right? It is my honor to welcome our guest speakers, one of the greatest anatomists of the world, I can say, uh, Professor Shane Tups, who is the editor-in-chief of Clinical Anatomy, editor of Gray's Anatomy, and uh, editor of Natus Atlas. Apart from that, recently he has been elected as the president of American Association of uh, Clinical Anatomists. And as far as I know that uh, he is a, a researcher of international repute who is having the age index of approximately 74 as far as I have seen the research gate. So I also welcome our eminent guest speaker, Dr. Reema Dada, uh, the distinguished anatomist and researcher who is presently working as a professor of anatomy at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I cordially welcome our distinguished anatomist, the dean of anatomy, you say, Dr. G.P. Paul, who is presently emeritus professor uh, in the Department of Anatomy at Mahatma Gandhi Memorial Medical College, Indore, who always inspire us to think and do. And apart from th that, we have with us uh, Professor T.S. Reiser, who was a formerly professor and head at uh, uh, Department of Anatomy, All India Institute of uh, Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and presently series heading the Department of Anatomy at North DMC Medical College, Delhi. Apart from that, we have with us uh, Dr. Ranjit Guha, who is the principal and professor of uh, anatomy, Indra, uh, who is uh, working at Indira Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Patna. And we have our senior Dr. T. Rajan, who is presently the vice principal, professor and head of anatomy at AVMC uh, Pondicherry. And thank you so much for accepting our request to chair the session, sir. We welcome you at this uh, program, World Anatomy Day, and the webinar, uh, which is on anat uh, research in anatomical sciences. I extend my warm welcome to our uh, Dr. M. Siv Kumar, sir, the beloved president of Society of Clinical Anatomists, who is presently the professor of anatomy at TSR, MMCH, and RC at Trichy. And we have very much uh, with us uh, our dynamic general secretary, uh, the Dr. Muthu Kumar Vail, sir, who is presently the vice principal and uh, the professor head of anatomy at SBMMC uh, Pondicherry. Then, apart from that, we have our treasurer, uh, Professor Dr. M. Kavimani with us. We welcome all of you, sir. So it is my immense pleasure to welcome all the office bearer of Society of Clinical Anatomists and the uh, dynamic team members of the editorial board of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy and members of the Society of Clinical Anatomists and all the delegates who have shown wonderful response uh, to our invitation to attend this academic feast. So uh, thank you so much from my side. Once again, I welcome each and every uh, delegates, the uh, office bearers, and the dignitaries to this World Anatomy Day program. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Over to Dr. Pushpa. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for that warm welcoming. Now we have our president of SOCA, Dr. M. Sivakumar, for presidential address. Dr. M. Sivakumar, currently working as professor of anatomy at TSR, MMCH, and RC. Atrishi has served as professor and head of anatomy, Jipmer, since 2010, with additional responsibilities of Dean Jipmer Karaikal. He was also MCI assessor for UG and PG courses. He is also member board of studies for UG and PG courses in Ames Bhubaneswar and Ames Rishikesh. He has been bestowed with Dr. P.C. Bansal Memorial Gold and Gold and Dr. 
Methilal Pan Memorial Gold Medal for paper published in JASI in 2003. He is an editor of Keith Moore Clinically Oriented Anatomy, first Southeast South Asian edition, and author of Anatomy and Physiology for General Nursing Midwifery textbooks. So to avoid uh, technical glitches, we will be having the presidential address in the form of this video.
thank you so much sir for your encouraging words now we have with us our beloved general secretary of soka dr muttu kumar avel to introduce our honorable chief guest dr muttu kumar avel has held various positions in his 17 years of working experience in different medical colleges including jipmer pondicherry currently he is working as vice principal professor and hod shri venkateshwara medical college pondicherry he was former vice principal at annapurna medical college salem and former deputy medical superintendent at shri venkateshwara medical college pondicherry he is the founder editor in chief of ngca which was started in salem in the year 2012 on behalf of soka he was the organizing secretary of second national conference of the soka held at salem he is a visionary leader and always a strong pillar of support for the journal activities i request you to introduce our honorable chief guest sir. over to you sir. thank you so much dr pushpa for your nice words i am very happy to be part of this webinar on world anatomy day this year i would like to introduce our chief guest for that uh, i want to share a powerpoint can you kindly make co host uh, dr shukla yes yes it is mr rani please give the right it is already given sir Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Good evening, all the dignitaries and the participants. As General Secretary of Society of Clinical Anatomy (SOCA), I am happy to be part of this webinar on World Anatomy Day. Respected Chief Guest Dr. Sudha Sesheen, respected guest speaker from USA Dr. Shane Tubbs, and Dr. Rima Dada, India. respected president of soka dr m shivakumar respected editor in chief of our journal njca dr kumar satish ravi respected treasurer of soka dr kavi mani dear editorial board members who organized this webinar and dear participants first of all as general secretary i welcome all of you i wish all the very best to dr kumar satish ravi and his organizing team soka and the association of our chief guest with soka dr sudha sesheen was also chief guest earlier for the first ever conference of soka on 9th of june 2012 at the hotel ashok residency in front of sri ramachandra medical college porur chennai india dr sudha sesheen only inaugurated our society that time and blessed our society our society is always grateful to ma'am with their blessings our society has grown today a strongest national society for mdms qualified anatomists of india Our society's journal, National Journal of Clinical Anatomy (NJCA), also got indexed in DOAG and Scopus by the efforts of our person editor in chief, Dr. Kumar Satish Ravi. In the first part of introduction, I want to present some of the memorable images from our chief guest's life, so that our budding anatomist get inspired and follow her footsteps to achieve maximum possible status as she has attained. Our chief guest, Dr. Sudha Sesheen. MBBS, MS, FRCS, Eden Pro. She had her uh, MBBS and uh, MS courses in Madras Medical College, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, India. In this photograph, you can see our uh, chief guest along with her parents. Our chief guest is not only interested in anatomy; she is interested in music and cultural activities also. So Chief Gash is a natural orator. He is always speaking with facts and figures. In the young age itself, he started participating in public speaking competitions and uh, used to get prizes, receiving prize from hands of Honorable K K Shah, former Governor of Tamil Nadu, from Sri Swaminathan, advisor to government, from Tara Chiriyat, Mayor of Madras. For literary ability, from Sri H S S Lawrence, 
Chief Education Officer for Scholastic Achievements, from Sri Rukmani Devi Arundel for Arts and Oratory Skill, from Justice Ismail, Chief Justice Tamil Nadu for Writing Skills, from Justice Suri Murthy, Judge of High Court for Sports, from Swami Ranganathan, Chief of Ramakrishna Mutt. This photograph shows the College Day memory of our Chief Guest. Our Chief Guest is sitting second from right. There is another public figure in the same photograph, second from left side. She is uh, none other than Dr. Tamil Sai Rajan, who is the present governor of Telangana. This photograph was taken at 1980s, at the time of uh, college days of our Chief Guest in Madras Medical College. With Professor Rangabhasham, our mentor, our Chief Guest is very much interested in uh, cultural activities. In this photograph, you can see her with a famous personality in Tamil Nadu, Kundrapudi Adigala, with Mrs. Oiji Partha Saradi, who is renowned educationist. She has started Padma Seshadri chain of schools in Chennai, with Sri G. Viswanathan, Vellur Institute of Technology, with Sri Jagat Rashagan, he is an educationist, also a politician. He is sitting in extreme left. Sri Aram Veerappan, next to our ma'am, at the center. With Dr. Kanta, who is an eminent anatomist of Karnataka. She was the first vice chancellor of Raji Gandhi University of Health Sciences at Karnataka, India. In this photograph, you can see the chief guest with our former president of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. As you know, Dr. Abdul Kalam, is known as a missile man of India. He was a scientist before getting elected as president of uh, our country. Incidentally, today is the birthday of our uh, beloved former president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Our chief guest uh, has translated one of the books of uh, former president, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. This is the releasing function where uh, a book translated by our chief guest was getting released by Dr. Kalam himself. The name of that book was Family and Nation. It was uh, translated in Tamil as Kudumbamum Desamum by our uh, beloved chief guest, Dr. Sundar Session, madam. In this photograph also, you can see our uh, chief guest along with Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. With the towering personalities, the former chief minister of uh, Tamil Nadu, Mr. M. Karunanidhi, the former Chennai mayor, Mr. M.K. Stalin, with the former chief minister of Tamil Nadu, Sir J. Jayalalitha, with the present chief minister of Tamil Nadu, Mr. M.K. Stalin. In pursuit of research, our uh, chief guest, the vice chancellor of Tamil Nadu, Dr. MJR University, she has signed a memorandum of understanding with the Brazil University of Mato Grosso. One more thing, very important thing as far as SOCA is concerned. The first conference of our Society of Clinical Anatomists. In that, our chief guest participated as chief guest at that time. She only inaugurated our society also at that time on 9th of June 2012. Also, our chief guest uh, delivered a guest lecture at that time, teaching anatomy to generation next opportunities and threats. At that time, our chief guest was the director of Institute of Anatomy, Madras Medical College. Thank you, Ananda, for the opportunity to introduce our uh, respected chief guest. There will be one uh, video presentation also followed by this. Thank you. Over to Dr. Kushwa. Mr. Shukla, please enable me. It's done, ma'am.
thank you so much for that introduction now i would humbly request our honorable chief guest to address the gathering Welcome. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I wish I stand up to your expectations and happy World Anatomy Day to all of you. Thank As you I me. try sharing the screen. Let me take this opportunity to wish each one of you, especially Professor Dr. Shiva Kumar, Professor Dr. Muttu Kumaravel, Professor Dr. Kavi Mani, Dr. Kumar Satish Ravi, Dr. Rose Xavier, the guest speakers of the day, Dr. Shane Tubbs from the United States, Dr. Reema Dada from New Delhi, various participants, delegates, and friends. Let me wish all of you a very happy Dashara and a very happy World Anatomy Day. As was already mentioned by Dr. Ravi, the World Anatomy Day is observed as a tribute to Vesalius, who left the mortal coils on the 15th of October in 1564. Andreas Vesalius is a Latinized name of Andreas Wiesel. And we learn it was customary or rather fashionable in the 16th century to get one's name Latinized. And that is how Wiesel became Vesalius. As a band of anatomists, we are aware that we owe a lot to Vesalius for modernizing our thinking on anatomy. As we pay our tribute and homage to Vesalius this day, I would like all of us to think a little on the importance and significance of anatomy. Anatomy forms the basis of life itself. Generally, in any medical school, anatomy is customarily dubbed a dead department, for we learn anatomy from cadavers. However, today is a day when we would have to rededicate ourselves to the cause of understanding the significance of anatomy. It is common knowledge that organisms all have specific characteristics based on their anatomy. Appearance of an individual or an organism, the adaptability quotient of an organism to its surroundings all depend on anatomy. In fact, survival of a species on the earth also depends on anatomy. We are all well aware of the fact that the dinosaurs were not able to survive on the earth primarily because of their size and structure. They were so large, though they were predatory, they were so large that they could not survive better in those circumstances which existed eons ago. However, the appearance of the large structure was all part of the anatomy of the dinosaurs, which made them difficult for survival. And that is why I would say survival of any species depends 
on its anatomy. As far as the human world is concerned, anatomy rules the world. You may be surprised as to why I make this statement. I am very aware that I am talking to a band of fresh anatomists, budding anatomists, experts in the field, people who contribute to the National Journal and people who contribute to the teaching of anatomy in this part of the world. I still make the statement that anatomy rules the human world. And why do I say so? This is just a piece of a chair. A piece of good looking furniture. But tell me, the furniture industry will flourish only if there is proper and appropriate knowledge of anatomy. Chairs would not be sold out. Chairs of the wrong kind will not be bought. That means even the industry of making chairs will have to be aware of appropriate anatomy. You come to the garment industry, you find all colorful garments there and stylized garments, garments which speak of the individual who wears the garment and in Tamil, we have the very old adage which says, Al padi, adai padi, meaning the garment or the dress is half of the individual. Even here, it is the anatomy, the external anatomy, the internal anatomy, the changes which happen in the external anatomy because of the internal structural layout that would decide the designs of garment too. These are just two examples to tell us that every factory, every industry, every sphere of activity in the human world is dependent in some way or the other on human anatomy human anatomy is required for the artists who paint portraits. Knowledge of human anatomy is required, maybe not to the extent that a medical graduate would read, but then at least to the appropriate extent, knowledge of human anatomy is required for the tailor to stitch the garment correctly, for the producer to make the factory flourish, for every industry, some bit of anatomy is required. And I would not be wrong when I say human anatomy has decided human civilization. And how? Here is a picture which kind of differentiates between the features of a quadruped and a biped. We all know the human being is a biped. Development of bipedalism was the crux around which human civilization developed. What happened when the quadrupeds became bipeds or the quadrupeds evolved into bipeds? You find there was increase in the length of the lower extremities, superior positioning of the entire body because of attaining an erect posture. Thereby, there was superior positioning of the head, superior positioning of the eyes, leading to binocular vision. And this resulted in a wider scope of vision. The biped individual or the biped species was able to see things better than the quadrupeds. The bipeds could look over the trees and the plantations and gauge if a wild animal was approaching. This in turn resulted in swift and agile movements of the individual. 
The increase in the length of the lower extremities provided the agility, shifting off the center of gravity accounted for the swift mobility of the biped individual. Associated with bipedalism, the forelimbs became free. The freeing of the forelimbs resulted in the various grips and the grafts, and all these ensured that the human being was able to better himself or herself. Combating and controlling of animals was possible. Innovations and tool use, since the four extremities became free, the human being or the proto-human even was able to play with things which were available around, was able to pick up the stones and make them into stone implements, hone the stones and make them into tools. And that is how tool use came into existence, which all led to the invention of the wheel and the invention of various gadgets and various implements. Farming, agriculture, once gadgets came, once implements came, even if they were crude, with those crude implements, the human beings were able to till the land, do the initial proto-farming and proto-agriculture, and slowly human civilization developed. If you trace the way human civilization got established, we cannot deny human anatomy was responsible for this kind of development. I would just like to give you a few words which give us the clue as to how human anatomy has decided mankind's development. We all know from our anatomy knowledge, this part of the human body is what is called the manus or the hand. Hand in very crude, non-scientific or unscientific language, but then the manus, the Latin term of manus in scientific terminology. All activities of humankind have been called the activity of hand. Not that we perform every activity with the hand, there are certain activities which we don't even perform with the hand. But if you trace the vocabulary of every language on earth, all activities of the human being, even if they are performed by other systems of the body, all activities are related to the hand. In Sanskrit, we call every activity as Krityam. Krityam is because it's done by the karam. Karam is the hand. In Tamil, we call it sayal, chai. Chai is the hand, and what is being done with the chai becomes chayal. It is true of every other language, almost all the cultured languages of the world. And in English, here is a manager of the office. And how does this term manager come? It's from manus. Manager is someone who's able to sit on top and managerially supervise, but then manager is a term which has come from manus. Management is also from manus. And manifest, when we say manifest, something manifested, it means something is clearly seen. It has exposed itself to become clearly seen. And how did this term come? Manus plus fest. Fest will mean something to be tapped with the hand. When you tap with the hand, you get to feel something. When you feel something, you're able to understand it. In manifestation, you're able to see and understand and that is how that word came into existence. And this is manufacturing. You see here in a factory, not all manufacturing is done by the hand. There are machines which do that, but still manu plus factum, manu plus factum. Manu is manus, 
factum is producing, produced by the hand, is the meaning of the word manufacture. And emancipate, once again, this word will mean, in technical terms, one gives the hand to lift someone to freedom, emancipate. And you see again the role played by the manners. Mandate. When we say mandate, it means the kind of giving the order to the hand, giving the control to the hand. There again, it is the manners. Manual. Not that all manuals are prepared by the hand only, but then for instruction, whenever you want to give instruction to humankind, you once again relate it to the hand. And there we understand that this hand has gained its importance primarily because of the bipedalism and the prehensile grip and the grasp which came to the free upper limb. So it is this anatomy which had decided the civilization and even our languages have derived themselves from this part of anatomy. And today we are in a world where we talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and so on. And please remember, all this is secondary to our knowledge of human anatomy. Friends, on this World Anatomy Day, when we think of research in anatomical sciences, especially with relation to translational research and so on, I would only want all of us to remember that it is anatomy that decides every bit of our activity in every plane, not only in the physical plane, but in the academic plane, in the societal plane, in the developmental plane, in the evolutionary plane, and in all spheres of human activity. I personally believe that this World Anatomy Day could be a day of rededicating ourselves to the knowledge of anatomy, to our learning of anatomy. And with these words, I'm very happy to have participated in the webinar, the international webinar, which has been raised up on the occasion of the World Anatomy Day by the National Journal of Clinical Anatomy and the Society of Clinical Anatomists. I wish the webinar all success, and I also wish that all anatomists may stand up, stand direct, look up and say, it is our knowledge of anatomy that has made the world stand up. All the best. I wish Soka a very promising future, more and more growth. And I also wish the National Journal of Clinical Anatomy long years of contributory service. Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. That was a wonderful presentation, emphasizing the importance of anatomy. Thank you for your words of wisdom and blessings. As a token of uh, gratitude, we would like to present this virtual felicitation for you. you Mr. Shukla. Mr. Ravi, please give the right.
thank you so much ma'am again uh, joining for joining with us moving on uh, we will be beginning our academic sessions we have the first guest lecture on reverse translational research in anatomy by eminent professor dr shin tabs to chair this session we have with us learned academicians dr gp pal and dr ts roy it gives me immense pride to introduce our chairpersons first we have dr gp pal who is a eminent professor author of many well accepted medical textbooks and an internationally reputed medical scientist in the field of human anatomy he is a dedicated teacher with four decades of teaching experience He is very popular among the students, and they respect him for his deep knowledge of the subject, his simplicity, and down-to-earth attitude. He has taught uh, thousands of students in various medical institutes of the country and in U.S. He has worked as visiting associate professor at the Medical College Philadelphia. He was further appointed as honorary visiting associate professor in the same institute. He is keen researcher, which is evident by the fact that. his research work is cited in more than 50 standard textbooks of medical sciences including grace anatomy textbook of neuroanatomy of orthopedics forensic medicine zoology etc he is the recipient of many national awards prizes and gold medals for his research including ss batnagar prize highest awards of the for the sciences in india he was elected as fellow of many prestigious academies of sciences like indian academy of sciences bangalore national academy of medical sciences new delhi national academy of sciences allahabad and also he holds fellowship and of nash anatomical society of india now we have our next uh, chairperson dr t s roy who is an accomplished scholar is a professor and head department of anatomy north delhi municipal medical college and hindu rao hospital delhi He has served in SGT Medical College, Ames, Delhi, under different designations. He was guest faculty at Duke University Medical Center, Durham, North Carolina, U.S., and research scientist and United States Environment Protection Agency. He is also adjunct faculty, GYG University, Gwalior, Central Core Research Facility, Neurosurgery Education and Training School, Ames, New Delhi. He has guided more than twenty postgraduates and holds membership in various national and international scientific societies. Being editorial member and reviewer of reputed journals of various specialties, Dr. Roy has published more than hundred scientific papers with thousand eight thirty eight citations, and his H index is twenty three. He has contributed eight book chapters. His quest for research has gained him. reputed fellowships like fellow international brain research organization fulbright post doctoral fellow and so on please join with me in welcoming our chairpersons dr gp pal and dr ts roy welcome you sir thank you thank now, you very much now we have our speaker for this session dr shane dubs We'll be introducing him by this video. Mr. Ravi, please give the right. Yeah. Set.
over to the chairpersons and the speaker to continue the session. Well, welcome, Dr. Tubbs, to this webinar of the SOCA. Now, I request you to begin your presentation, please. And after your presentations, we will take up the questions, okay? So please, I hand over this to Dr. Tubbs, please, for his presentation on the reverse translation research in anatomy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If I could have uh, the yeah, ability please, to share, share my right. Mr. Ravi, already given him, sir, to Dr. Shane. Sorry, but I'm still unable to share my screen. So I have already given you the rights, Dr. Shane. So you can see the share uh, your screen uh, tab uh, down below. Yes, it's uh, it's there, but it's not uh, illuminated. Okay, just hold on. Thank you. Can you please read that, sir? I have done the night again. I apologize, but it's still not allowing me to share. Okay. Uh, never mind, sir. Do, Dr. Pushpa, do we have the presentations of Dr. Shane so we can uh, play it at your end? I don't have. Actually, uh, if you can join using the app, then I think you can share. So. No, I have actually yeah. made a uh, have a presenter, uh, but I think he's not been able to do that. Ravi sir, you are unmuted. May I give you the right order, Pushpa? You can play the his slides. No, I don't have his slides. Okay. Just give me a second, Dr. Tab. Roshan, can you please try again once more, sir? I see the share button, but it's uh, not illuminated, so it doesn't allow me to click. Okay, so uh, it does not, you're saying it's not active? Correct, correct. Okay, uh, on the back hand, uh, uh, Dr. Pushpa, can we just... Uh, can you email me your presentation? We will run it from here. I can do that. Uh, please share your yeah. uh, PowerPoint, sir. Yeah, sorry about that. I apologize to all my attendees for this technical glitch, but we'll be online very soon.
It's slowly coming to you, Professor Ravi. No problem, sir. I'll, I'll just. You should have Ravi, it. let me know when you received it, Dr. Ravi, so I can give you the founding rights. Yeah, I have received your PowerPoint, sir. Shall I give you the right right now, sir? Dr. Ravi, I, can, I have made you a presenter, sir, so you can go ahead and present. Okay. I apologize to all my attendees and the participants that uh, for technical glitch, but very soon we're going to start the session of Dr. Singh. Ravi, are you sharing, sharing your slides, sir? I'm just downloading it. Okay. Fair enough. Has it been downloaded, sir? Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting downloaded.
it visible? Yes, sir. I think it's appearing. Thank you very much. I apologize for the technical glitch. So, first and foremost, uh, I would like to greet everyone and uh, wish you a happy uh, World Anatomy Day. Uh, next, please. Especially uh, warm greetings uh, from the United States. Uh, namaste. Uh, warm wishes from the American Association of Clinical Anatomists. And finally, uh, many thanks to the Society of Clinical Anatomists, uh, all of the uh, previous distinguished speakers, uh, my forthcoming speakers, all of our uh, viewers, and a special thanks to uh, Professor Kumar Satish Ravi for his uh, very kind invitation to have me speak to you today. Thank you. Next. So, what I would like to talk to you about, and as uh, elaborated on by our honorable uh, guest speaker, uh, who mentioned that many people around the world, uh, as we all know, uh, think of anatomy as a dead discipline, and they believe that uh, it's antiquated, old fashioned, and not as uh, necessary in a modern curriculum. Uh, people will also say that research in anatomy is a dead science and I hope that through this presentation I can uh, convince those in the audience who may be some of, uh, of that thinking uh, quite the opposite. So what I would like to introduce to you is just one lab's experience uh, with something that I've coined as uh, reverse translational research and that is uh, having ideas uh, that are centered around clinical problems, surgical problems, going into the anatomy lab using this huge wonderful resource that we all have that is the human cadaver and then taking that information and applying it back to patient care um, next slide please so the idea of this paradigm that we've used i think is very simple but uh, believe me many uh, anatomists and other scientists uh, have trouble uh, getting a firm grip of this and implementing it. But uh, as simple as I can make it is that we have some surgical or clinical problem, complication, et cetera. We design a cadaveric study. And uh, many of the first examples I'll share with you are feasibility studies. We then publish the feasibility study and we wait. We wait for clinicians uh, around the world to look at the study and see if it's something that they wish to try in their own patients. Uh, the hope is that many of these will go on to be used by clinicians and surgeons, and then they will publish that information, and then that will help improve patient care uh, for many patients around the world. Next slide, please. So my philosophy is based upon this very, very simple Latin uh, phrase, uh, which essentially means this is the place where the dead teach the living. And I think uh, I'm preaching to the choir when I tell you that uh, we uh, have cadavers and that's a huge luxury. Those people uh, make a, a donation uh, to mankind and we should get as much from those donations as possible. This slide uh, I want to emphasize to you is that if you look at normal translational research, uh, let's say, for example, someone's working on a new uh, treatment for a disease, the time, the average time from the translational research uh, beginning until it actually reaches a patient is 17 years. So many people will die of the disease long before any type of application of the research comes. So what we tried to do with anatomical research is to change that uh, number. Next slide, please. And hopefully through uh, these uh, next several slides, I'll convince you that that's something that we can alter. So um, I've used this paradigm for about 25 years. And if you can click, please. Uh, and that uh, with this, we've uh, essentially uh, come up with new bone, soft tissue, nerve grafts um, from the human body, tested in the cadaver, and then most of these have gone on to be used for patient care. Next, please. So new surgical approaches can be devised by coming up with them first in the cadaver. 
Uh, and then finally, if you click, please, the ultimate aim is to uh, have uh, improved patient care. Next, please. And also to give the surgeon, uh, et cetera, different uh, options. So let me go through some of these. Uh, we recently published a paper where we just es essentially looked back at the history of about uh, 40 or so uh, feasibility studies that were performed in the cadaver. And we asked the question, can these reach patients faster than normal uh, translational research? Next, please. And we found that uh, looking at the studies that uh, about 22% of the cadaveric feasibility studies within about uh, seven years um, were referenced in uh, regard to their clinical presentation. And if you boil that down, it sees that essentially uh, the average was about three years from the study until it was used in a patient population. And you can compare that with the 17 years of a traditional research paradigm. Next slide, please. So, uh, if you could just click slowly here, this is uh, one uh, example uh, where we took a surgical problem, uh, clinical problem that is, where we have high cervical quadriplegia, that is a high cervical spinal cord injury. These patients uh, often will die due to respiratory compromise, and that is because they're on a ventilator. So, we thought, can we reestablish connections to the diaphragm uh, make it work and remove this uh, morbidity. So we looked at using uh, the spinal accessory nerve in the posterior triangle and then moving that nerve to the phrenic nerve, uh, which is not functioning in these patients, uh, sew them together, wait for a period of time and see if now the spinal accessory nerve axons can re innervate the phrenic nerve. Next slide, please. So this was a feasibility study. And then in 2011, uh, a Chinese group uh, tried this for the first time uh, using the techniques that we outlined in our feasibility study. And uh, if you look at the next slide, they took a patient uh, who was essentially ventilator dependent. Next, please. And they used uh, the techniques that we had described. So they uh, exposed the spinal accessory nerve in the posterior triangle of the neck, they exposed the phrenic nerve, they sewed them together, and this patient, uh, within a short period of time, had diaphragmatic uh, function return and was extubated, the breathing tube was removed, and they went home uh, to live out their life. Next slide, please. We've also looked at uh, other clinical problems. Uh, one is uh, hydrocephalus. And where do you divert the fluid with your shunt? And usually this goes to the peritoneum, but for multiple reasons, often the peritoneum is not a good site due to infection or other problems uh, with the abdomen. And we looked at, if you uh, can go to the next slide, putting the distal part of uh, the shunt into a bone as the receptacle. So can uh, bone receive large quantities of fluid and return this to the central uh, venous circulation? And the answer in the cadaver was that we could administer large amounts of fluid. Uh, if you see the pictures to the far upper right and the far lower right, these are from a primate study where we uh, implanted uh, tubes into the sternum. We infused it with uh, super physiologic amounts of fluid and the animals uh, did well without any physiologic compromise. Next slide, please. So then we wait, uh, this is published, and then we look for someone around the world to mimic this. This is uh, from Hong Kong, where they took a patient. Next slide, please. And uh, they uh, had the patient with uh, hydrocephalus, as you can see in the left image, top left, uh, the ventricles are dilated. They put the distal part of the tubing into the sternum as uh, described in our feasibility study. And as you look at the ventricular size over time, the ventricles uh, come down to a, a normal size. Next, please. We've also uh, talked about the feasibility of uh, patients who have uh, uh, large significant injuries to their brachial plexus. Uh, in this example, on the right brachial plexus, 
um, the right neck has been injured and the idea was take a functioning nerve from the contralateral side of the body and in this case it's the spinal accessory nerve dissect it free from the overlying trapezius and move it subcutaneously to both either suprascapular nerve or musculocutaneous with the idea that you can neuroterize these nerves and regain function in uh, both the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and anterior arm muscles, allowing the patient to flex their arm and um, have some abduction and external rotation. Next slide, please. So this was used uh, uh, in a group uh, from India and in, uh, Delhi, and uh, they did this successfully in a series of patients and uh, all of their patients had full restoration of uh, those muscle functions. Next slide, please. Uh, and additionally, you'll see that other groups will mimic the paper. So uh, the Indian group was the uh, pioneer group to do this in a set of patients. Uh, and then soon after that, this group from Italy uh, used the same technique and had success with uh, total brachial plexus palsies. Next slide, please. We've also looked at using the knowledge that we all have of the human body, for example, uh, you know, different parts of bones that can be uh, removed uh, without penal penalty to the patient. Uh, one uh, problem that the surgeons uh, face is where to get bone graft if they're trying to fuse two adjacent uh, cervical vertebrae. And often they've gone to the iliac crest, which has uh, a multitude of various complications that can occur. Our uh, technique used in the uh, cadaver was to harvest a small sample of the adjacent clavicle, easy to get to, and then uh, place this into the intervertebral space. Next slide. This was uh, then tried uh, by uh, this group from Japan, and uh, they used the same methods uh, that we outlined in the feasibility study. And if you look at the next slide, you'll see the long-term uh, clinical uh, imaging. Um, next, please. Uh, here you can see uh, to the far left images, these show you the implantable cage, which is a metal cage, and within that contains a clavicle that was harvested from this patient. Uh, you can see in the middle images, uh, the clavicle has a small piece that's been removed, and then you see the patient in the far right who has a, a good cosmetic outcome. Next slide, please. We've looked at... Uh, more, or I should say, less invasive approaches to uh, decompressing the suprascapular nerve at the suprascapular notch. Uh, this is a, a problem because of uh, all of the overlying muscles. It takes a very deep uh, approach. Exploration is uh, fairly morbid, and uh, it's a deep uh, corridor for the surgeons to work in. So the idea was to do this minimally invasive and to uh, use an endoscope. Next slide. We used a small, as you can see in the upper right, 1.1 uh, diameter endoscope, a small incision that was centered over the uh, suprascapular uh, notch uh, ligament. And you can see in the far uh, bottom right, uh, the approach that was used. Once the uh, nerve was visualized, uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we see the nerve, uh, suprascapular nerve, and to the right we see post-transection of the suprascapular ligament, which is shown at the lower arrow. Um, so feasible uh, to do in the cadaver. Uh, we then waited, and uh, if you'll look at the next slide, please. We see that uh, various groups, this group in uh, the U.S., uh, began using uh, the endoscopically um, assisted suprascapular nerve decompression technique in a large series of patients uh, who uh, had good outcomes. Next slide, please. Uh, and then you'll see that additional groups, this is a group of over 300 patients that uh, underwent the same technique and they had good long-term success in these patients. Next slide, please. You can see in the upper left, this is an endoscopic view from a patient, and uh, we'll see at the arrow the transected suprascapular ligament, and at the asterisk, we see the suprascapular nerve. 
Next slide, please. And we've also looked at uh, various ways occasionally to get to the vagus nerve and uh, usually for neurosurgeons who are trying to get to the vagus nerve, they want to put a vagal nerve stimulator on it uh, for patients with uh, medically intractable epilepsy. Uh, often, though, if you go back for revision, there's scar tissue, uh, the vagus nerve is more difficult to dissect. So we use the simple idea of approaching the vagus nerve in the neck from the posterior cervical triangle, as you see in the schematic. This was easily done in the cadaver. And uh, with the next slide, you'll see an example of uh, a clinical uh, case where uh, the patients underwent the same uh, approach through a posterior uh, cervical triangle um, uh, vantage point. Next slide, please. We're always on the search for different uh, bones of the human, autologous bones uh, that can be used for grafting material. Uh, often when the patient uh, is uh, face down in the procedure and there's a large uh, opening that needs to be filled with bone, uh, the surgeon is left with uh, using artificial material, which is not always ideal. Uh, they can use cadaveric tissues, again, not always ideal. And looking for bone that's expendable uh, is sometimes difficult. So we had the idea of looking at the uh, infraspinous fossa, removing a piece of bone, leaving the, the thicker, harder uh, cortical rim, and then um, taking that bone and using it for cranioplasty. And if you look at the next slide, um, that technique uh, was used. This is a artificial opening we've made uh, into the calvaria. Uh, this is the left temporalis. And then we've piecemealed, placed all of the pieces of the ipsilateral uh, scapular um, harvest and then sewn that into the edges with suture. Uh, next slide, please. This shows uh, a clinical application. So uh, 14 patients with very large uh, cranial defects, uh, calvarial defects, underwent a combination in this case of uh, both uh, use of the rib, scapula, uh, and split thickness grafting. And the next picture, please, will uh, show you uh, the large uh, opening into the cranium uh, seen here on the left. Uh, this was done for trauma. And then you'll see to the right that a large piece of the um, autologous scapula has been used to fill in this large spot. Next slide, please. I love this saying, and I'll, I'll have these uh, peppered throughout the uh, talk. Uh, sometimes I think that, not I think, but I agree with uh, uh, Bornstein, who said, the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. Next slide, please. Also, uh, one of the former Grey's Anatomy editors, uh, and I think uh, I will have very little trouble convincing everyone in this audience that anatomy is far from stationary, uh, unlike uh, what many lay people believe, uh, either in its facts, right? So for research or in its improvements of how we present the anatomy. So teaching. Next slide, please. What I would like to now uh, change gears and for the last part of the presentation, give you some ideas because one of the most common presentations that I, excuse me, questions that I receive is where do you come up with these type of questions? And I think this is a, a fairly short list that will give you some examples. So queries from clinical colleagues who have the question based on uh, their uh, complications. Some are hypothesis driven, some are just found by serendipity. Some are rediscoveries. We should always remember that our past uh, um, anatomists were very smart and discovered many things that we've forgotten about. Sometimes you should look through a different lens when you're trying to come up with an idea and not be uh, tethered to old tradition. And then sometimes verifying the work of others will uh, result in uh, new discoveries. Next slide, please. So one question is that when the spine surgeons are doing a posterior decompression of the spinal canal, they often will tell me, uh, why does the lumbar ligamentum flavum have two layers? Um, I always see the two layers during my dissection and I make sure to uh, dissect them. Uh, and as you will know from most anatomy texts, we do not see that description of a two layered ligamentum flavum. So why are they seeing this? And what we found, uh, next slide, please. 
is that if you look at the section through a lumbar vertebra and you look at the capsular ligaments, if you look at the interspinous ligament and the ligamentum flavum, next slide please, and we remove the adjacent uh, bone, uh, we can see the capsular ligaments are folded and uh, posteriorly, we see the ligamentum flavum, we see the interspinous ligament, uh, and then if we go to the next slide please, uh, with histology, uh, all bone removed, you'll notice uh, that in the far bottom with the uh, red square marked one, this is the interspinous ligament. And if you note and follow the interspinous ligament, it's confluent and is actually the same as the ligamentum flavum. So the take home message is ligamentum flavum does not have two layers. It is uh, that the surgeon is seeing the capsular ligament. That's why they think that's part of the ligament and flavum. And then the, the discovery here is that interspinous and ligament and flavum are one in the same ligament. Next slide, please. Uh, we've also have hypothesis driven uh, types of questions. Uh, for example, we're all uh, taught and we teach that the cervical spinal nerves will innervate uh, especially C3 and C4, the trapezius muscle, and we often see that described as a, either a sensory or proprioceptive type of innervation. Next slide. And then essentially this study that you can uh, read on your own at your own leisure uh, found that these nerves are not carrying predominantly sensory or proprioceptive tissues, these are carrying motor fibers. And this goes along with patients where we know that the spinal accessory nerve has been cut, uh, but the patient retains trapezius function. Next slide, please. We've also found things by serendipity. So you're looking for something else and you find uh, quite something different. So we found that the inferior gluteal nerve that we always teach is a motor branch uh, of the sacral plexus. Uh, that it actually, in the majority of specimens, if you look for it very, very carefully, and it's a difficult dissection, you can find a cutaneous branch. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, the right gluteal region. Uh, to the right of your screen is cranial. To the uh, left of your screen is caudal. And we've color-coded the uh, cutaneous branches over the gluteus maximus, and you'll see the superior middle cluneals. And when we first saw these lower branches that were piercing the gluteus maximus, we assumed that these were inferior cluneals that were just piercing uh, the muscle. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, however, if you uh, follow those down to the source, they're originating off of the uh, inferior gluteal nerve. And the area of innervation is within this blue uh, dashed area. So it's over the posterior aspect of the uh, proximal femur and most likely this nerve is being damaged with posterior approaches for hip replacement. Next slide, please. Some discoveries uh, are actually rediscoveries and we again should not forget our um, pioneering predecessors. And I love the phrase that if you want a new idea to look at, and this is for all of the young anatomists online, uh, you go read an old book because many times the, the old books are full of a wealth of treasures of knowledge. Uh, we looked at something called Gerber's ligament, and I know of just about one reference that has talked about this. And with the next slide, please, I will uh, show you that anatomy. Here to the right, uh, one sees the uh, identification of the ligaments of the cranial cervical junction. We see the crucia ligament, cruciform ligament, and if you peel down the superior band or superior cruce of the cruciate ligament, there's a small, deeper portion of that cruce that attaches not to the basion, but directly to the posterior uh, part of the odontoid process, as you can see in the cadaver dissection to the left. So this is a rediscovery of something uh, termed Gerber's ligament. Next slide, please. So I want to uh, summarize uh, this talk uh, and open up for discussion. And uh, quo vadimus is where are we going with anatomy uh, research? Um, I can make a few statements based on you know, my um, experience uh, that based on um, our lab, 
that first of all, cadaveric feasibility studies or what we've coined as reverse translational research in anatomy uh, can drive clinical practice. Um, and that's a very powerful uh, position to take. The average time between publication of the uh, anatomical study and then the published clinical use of the study was only 3.4 years. So it uh, incredibly speeds up the time uh, between study and application to patients. And I think that's the essence of what we as clinical anatomists are trying to do. And then finally, uh, again, mostly for the younger uh, crowd is that collaborating with surgeons and clinicians who are in the trenches, treating patients, uh, having problems, will give you the best ideas and will help you design and implement the anatomical feasibility studies or uh, typical studies and use them for patient application. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for your attention. I, I've had a pleasure uh, speaking to you today and I hope that Maybe some small thing that I've mentioned may help to spark the uh, interest of someone in the crowd to go out and uh, be invigorated with uh, research and clinical anatomy. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm uh, also very happy to take questions at my uh, email account. So if you think of something afterwards or uh, if you want to reach out uh, in the future, uh, that's how to contact me. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thanks so much, Dr. Shane. Dr. Pushra, may I ask you to just uh, read out any questions that we have, maybe on the QA panel or something? Hello. Yes, Dr. Hello. No, this is Dr. G.P. Pal. Can you listen me? Yes, sir. Audible, sir. You're audible. Yes, yes. I will request Dr. T.S. Roy if he has some questions or uh, allow me to have some questions, please. Okay, so I have a couple of questions before we just ask the audience to ask the question from Professor. Yes, sure, Tom, sir. Okay? Sure, sir. Dr. T.S. Roy, please. Dr. Rai, your voice is not uh, audible, sir. Can you please speak a little louder? Yeah, I'm speaking louder only. Keep giving talk and uh, so are you so I'm much, sorry, uh, Dr. Rai, your voice is not audible, sir. You are not audible at all. I'm so sorry, sir. Can I speak now? Uh, Dr. Paul, you go ahead, sir. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Tup. Rather, I should say Professor Tup. Thank you very much for your nice presentation regarding this reverse translational uh, research in anatomy. We learned everything. What you said, sir, most of us must have, uh, I mean to say, convinced with what you said that this kind of research is the future, especially in the clinical anatomy, because this is the clinician based research. The clinicians, that is, physicians and surgeons, have problems and then they will raise the problems how to treat those patients which are having problem. And if they take the, I mean to say, help from anatomist, Anatomists go to the dissection hall, dissect it, study the problem, and come back to the ward with the patients. And this type of the research takes, as you said, very less time from reaching uh, from the bench to that of the uh, clinical wards. Okay, as you said that the otherwise the timing is 17 years, but with this kind of the reverse translational risk research, the timing is only three to four years for the benefit of the patients where it can be utilized. Okay, it's all, so everything is good, okay? Uh, but then, I would like, before I ask some question, I would like to make a comment that in India, 
we are at advantage for this reverse translational uh, research because most of the anatomists in India, they are the clinician, they are medical graduates. I think up to 90% of uh, our anatomists, they are medical graduates and they have, uh, I mean to say, they know know about the patients okay of course some of them may be practicing some of them may not be practicing but it is not like the case in united states where most of the uh, i mean to say anatomists they are from the, uh, the non-medical field okay uh, this is true but then still we are lacking the hospital connections here in india which should be provided or the clinical anatomists should try to have a group with the clinicians and then we can uh, solve the problem and then we can bring many more research projects okay to the anatomy department which can be easily solved there may be many way by which we can start working and can start getting the benefit as you have got since you said that in last 25 years, you must have published about 1700 papers, okay, PN, in the peer reviewed journal. That is quite a big achievement, I will say that. Thank you for your comments. I would, uh, I agree with that. And uh, uh, your summary is uh, spot on. Uh, and I think if, you know, we have uh, folks who are not uh, going to the hospital every day, uh, seeing patients, uh, sometimes uh, they forget about, you know, the day-to-day uh, -day problems that might occur uh, on a service and uh, thinking about those uh, and uh, addressing them with, a, you know, anatomical study is a very good method in my opinion. is limited to a particular problem or a very narrow area but what about those research which needs a large i mean say in investigations okay large i mean to say area to be studied for example your own work on the cranio cervical junction as you have studied extensively the lumbar facet tropism you have studied the cherry malformation you have studied the skull base and the cervical spine uh, involvement and the problem associated with it i don't think that they can be solved those type of the larger problem because they are not only limited to that piece of the skull they are also extensive including the, uh, this, uh, I mean to say, spina bifida, which may extend up to the sacral region. The extensive studies are also needed. Okay, sir, this is my first question. What should be done? Where can it is, is it possible to solve this problem with that of the, uh, I mean to say, reverse translational research? And second important question, which you have pointed out that, in case of the spinal accessory now, which is supplying to the trapezius, you mentioned that at the cervical second and third uh, uh, is a proprioceptive norm, and you found that it is not. I also believe that this cannot be only a sensory norm. It has to be motor, because if you see the origin of the trapezius, it is coming down below from 12th thoracic vertebrae. A spinal accessory, which is taking origin from medulla, cannot go to that of the T12 level. I believe that there will be many more motor, I mean to say supply from the thoracic part of the lower thoracic part of the nerve, which has to be investigated. And this was a very important, uh, I mean to say your hint that we should take up this study that trapezius is not only supplied by the cervical uh, spinal accessory. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. If you have something to comment, otherwise we open it for uh, the questions from the audience. And have you received the questions from audience, please? Ah, uh, yes, sir. We have a few questions from the audience in the chat box. Yes, please. Uh, first of all, uh... yeah. Am I audible now? Yes, Doctor Roy. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah.
so i have a question uh, am i audible now yes sir yes sir you are very much audible hello you are very much audible sir hello sir you sir, are quite you are audible, audible sir. sir please shoot your question audible. dr roy sir you are audible please please go ahead am i audible now yes, yes sir yes, yes sir, sir. audible sir please please go ahead dr roy sir you are audible please please ask question dr roy sir dr roy i think sir lost the connection we'll proceed with few of the questions which are put in the chat box uh, many of them have uh, praised the session um uh they are, uh, Mah dr mahajan is asking uh, dr tufts all this research was it done on fresh cadavers or soft embalmed cadavers a great question. Thank you for your question. We uh, use both. So uh, some studies lend themselves uh, to being able to use uh, embalmed specimens. Uh, some studies where we need either mobility uh, or we need uh, uh, lack of formalin in the tissues, uh, then we would prefer to use uh, a fresh uh, frozen specimen, which um, for our surgical courses is what we would normally use. And then uh, Dr. Doris has asked, have you worked in reverse translational research for purposes other than surgical inquest or surgical approaches, procedures, example, a medicine or imaging? What are your comments on its use in these areas? Absolutely. So I, I tailored my presentation uh, mostly for surgical application of the reverse uh, translational research. But we've done many, many studies that uh, are essentially clinically based. Um, they may have to do with uh, something that the clinician does on a regular basis, like lumbar puncture, um, et cetera. But uh, they're all uh, clinically uh, anatomically related is, is the main point. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have... Uh... Any, uh, are there any alternative to treatment of diseases currently treated by gene therapy as gene therapy is costly? Using, yes, please. Uh, the, the problem with gene research in the cadaveric tissue is that uh, the um, specimens are no longer living. So uh, getting good gene research from the cadaver, that's a problem and it's something that uh, we don't do any do much of just because of the nature of the cadaver. Okay. Uh, Dr. Vasudha has written, respected sir, thank you for uh, sharing your enriching experience. Uh, how far and how much can anatomists contribute to computational uh, neuroanatomy? I think uh, having, you know, neuroanatomists and anatomists alike involved with computational, uh, you know, studies is, is huge. Um, for example, our uh, various radiology groups will consult uh, the anatomy group uh, for their expertise, um, which, you know, imaging to cadaveric tissues is not always the same. And uh, getting another perspective from someone who's dealing with those tissues on a, a daily basis, like a neuroanatomist, uh, can be eye-opening, I think, sometimes uh, to uh, people that are doing those type of computational studies. Okay. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Mahajan has written, Dr. Tubbs, just a query for the scapular grafting. What was the time taken for the bone to heal? So, in the clinical application, um, the um, authors did not uh, show uh, the post-operative uh, scapula and didn't give us uh, good uh, long-term knowledge about how long it took for the grafting site to heal. Um, the grafting site for the scapula would be the same as any other bone, so, um, you know, equivalent to how long it takes a humerus to heal. So, um, my uh, guess is that it would be uh, many months. Uh, not weeks. Okay. 
and uh, Dr. Arthi has written, uh, sir, it was a very uh, interesting presentation. My doubt is, do clinical anatomists work inside the operation theater with surgeons in US? Uh, that is one very good way to ensure the surgeons know about various uh, uh, anatomical variations and also enhance feasibility studies as you have suggested. It's a great question. And I would tell you that in the US, uh, which is uh, the only thing I can speak to, uh, most surgeons would not have an anatomist, clinical anatomist in the operating theater. That would be very uncommon. Um, I think maybe my involvement in the OR theater was an anomaly. And uh, uh, hopefully, you know, looking at the um, amount and application of what we've done in my career will show surgeons of the future that it might be a good idea. Uh, to invite the clinical anatomist into the operating room for their perspective, because uh, we, uh, and I'm speaking to the choir here, know the anatomy uh, usually much better than uh, the technicians, the surgeons doing the procedures. Um, so we can be a, a huge asset, in my opinion. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, many have written, it was nice presentation. It was uh, so enriching presentation. Uh, I have no more uh, queries. Um, okay, any uh, queries from the chat? Dr. Pushpa, yeah. may I we may just request Dr. Roy if he has some questions. He was trying to yeah, ask some questions. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, you please ask your question, sir. Okay. okay. Yeah. I actually I want to comment that uh, as Dr. Paul has already told that, that uh, we are clinicians and clinician anatomists. In AIMS, I have in AIMS generally, I have a lot of experience that many clinicians uh, used to come to anatomy dissection hall to solve their problems. Mainly the physicians, um, they also used to come and to uh, give suggestions regarding uh, many things. Like I can give one example, uh, I work with the gastroenterologist and they told that in ancient um, India, uh, the bitter gourd was uh, given to treat uh, diabetes. So they have told us, can you try? Or uh, for the uh, case of actual pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis, garlic has been given. So we are giving the trial uh, in rats. In We have experimental models of acute and chronic pancreatitis and we are trying it. So um, in, in, in India, this kind of um, reverse uh, approach is there already, it is there. My last question or comment is that, have you seen any osteomyelitis when you have uh, given this uh, ventricular stunt? Is that, uh, uh, what are the incidents of osteomyelitis in these cases? Thank you for your question. Uh... For the first question, uh, thank you. I appreciate those comments. For the second question, we have not seen osteomyelitis uh, in any of these situations. What about the pain? The sternum is a very painful uh, puncture, is a very painful uh, thing. So, uh, did it's, the pain complain of pain? How you have yeah. managed pain? So, uh, the comparison we have is that for emergent uh, uh, resuscitation with IV fluids, if uh, the uh, central veins, peripheral veins are not available for the IV fluid to be administered, then emergently the tibia can be used. And then here uh, in this country, sometimes the sternum is also used. So, um, it's, it's a common procedure um, and the complaints from bone harvest from the traditional iliac crest uh, are sometimes more than the overall procedure complaints. So iliac crest we know is a very sensitive area. Um, from what I can gather from the clinical application of the sternal puncture, um, the, the pain is relatively uh, minimal. Okay, thank you, Dr. Puspano. Yeah, one more person has asked, uh, is it more valuable to read anatomy or other divisional journals to approach translational research? I think, and this is only my opinion, thank you for your question, that uh, if we want to continue to be relevant in the medical world, uh, if we continue to uh, show that anatomy is uh, important for medical education, uh, then we need to give evidence for that. 
And by doing clinical anatomy research, we're providing evidence that administrators, students can appreciate and realize that we're doing something uh, for the here and now, uh, and we're not just teaching morphology. Okay, thank you so much. And there are various comments mentioning excellent talk uh, by Dr. Tabs. Uh, the session was more informative. Uh, many more like that compliments you have got. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question. Uh, please throw light on research scope in head and neck surgery. Uh, you know, for head and neck, uh, and we've done lots of head and neck uh, research uh, in regard to head and neck surgery. Uh, I think uh, the, the sky's the limit. Uh, there's so much in the head and neck that we all know as anatomists is poorly understood. Um, the head and neck has so many complications after surgical procedures that almost any structure in the head and neck that if you target it, uh, you're going to help some patient somewhere. Okay, thank you so much. So, if there is no query, so thank you so much for that. And we would like to uh, present this virtual felicitation for you uh, for uh, this wonderful talk. We also like to uh, pay our gratitude by felicitating our chairpersons. Well, I thank Soka and I also thank the National General of Clinical Anatomies for inviting me as a chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, very so much. Sorry. I'm very sorry that I had a technical problem. I thank Dr. Ravi and all the dignitaries of this society for giving me a chance to chair this session. Um, I visit um, USA many times, so uh, I, I have visited Tulane University also. So if I get a chance, I would like to meet you in person. Dr. Tops, please. It would be my distinct pleasure. Thank you. We all heartedly thank uh, the chairpersons and the speaker for this wonderful session. Moving on, uh, now we have our uh, second guest lecture for that. Uh, we have an inspiring professor, Dr. Rima Dada, and to chair this session, uh, we have with us Dr. Ranjit Kuha and Dr. T. Raj. Uh, Doctor... I would like to personally thank Professor Tab, sir, for uh, accepting our invitation, and even uh, during this uh, time zone difference, you accepted our invitation, and that uh, at the early morning, you are delivering the lecture. Uh, hats up to you. Even we cancelled the previous webinar, but still, uh, means I, I have no words to express my gratitude towards you, sir. Thank you so much. And I, I feel that all 
the Indian anatomists uh, loved uh, to listen to your talk, sir. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Grateful, sir. Welcome. It's all my pleasure. Thank you. So for the, the next session, we have the two chairpersons. Dr. Ranjit Guha as a gold medalist in MS Anatomy is currently working as principal Indira Gandhi Institute of Medical Sciences, Bihar. He has served in different medical colleges in various positions. With vast research experience, Dr. Guha has published more than 150 scientific articles in noted national and international journals and conferred fellow of Indian Academy of Medical Specialities for academic excellence. He has number of awards for his credits like Best Speaker Award, Best Thesis Award, Engus PG Teacher uh, Award, Engus Senate Member, Special Honor for Academic Excellence, and so on. And the next uh, chairperson for this session will be Dr. T. Rajan. Uh, Dr. T. Rajan is currently working as Vice Principal, HOD of Anatomy, AVMC and Hospital, Puducherry. Uh, he is known for his organizing and team spirits. He has hosted various national and international conference. He has served in various administrative posts. He has published in a reputed journal uh, with high impact factor. Please join with me to welcome our chairpersons. Now, uh, to introduce our guest speaker, we have a video. kind introduction. Can you just make me the host so I can share my slides? I mean, I've done that, Dr. Ina. Please go ahead. Can you see my slides? Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a great honor and a privilege to uh, deliver this talk on the occasion of the World uh, Anatomy Day. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ravi, the Chief Editor of National Journal of Clinical Anatomy, Dr. M. Shiva Kumar, the President of SOCA, the Secretary of SOCA, and uh, uh, for giving me this opportunity to deliver this talk. It's really a humbling experience to speak in the presence of Dr. Shane Tubbs and Dr. Sudha Seshayan, who are such starting personalities. 
And today I would be talking on yoga and its impact on the genome and epigenome and the evidence-based studies that we've been carrying on. The roadmap for today's talk is, I would uh, uh, show by evidence-based studies that how yoga, a profound science of uh, science and technology of well-being, how it impacts both the mind and the body, and how it modulates the internal pharmacy and impacts both the genome and the epigenome. The various benefits that we hear of yoga are through the modulation of the epigenome. I'll just briefly highlight what is the epigenome. And to give examples of how yoga benefits, I have taken the example of few diseases that we are working on. These are the complex diseases. So what are complex diseases? And how these diseases have some common underlying architecture. So what are complex diseases? These are diseases which have uh, which are altering due to the interaction between genes and environment and there is the role of several genes each of which has a small additive effect and the effect of our lifestyle and social habits and it has been seen that it could either be diabetes cardiovascular disease depression cancer autoimmune disease or humanity. these diseases all have some shared underlying mechanism which i'll tell you during the course of my talks and you will also understand that in modern medicine, and especially in this age of super specialization, nothing can target each of the underlying mechanisms as well as yoga. So we are brought up with this paradigm that genes determine our destiny. And that's known as genetic determinism, that our biology, our phenotype is determined by the genes. And, but now we know that there is something operating above the genetic landscape and that is known as epigenetics or the genetics of free will. And that actually tells us that our lifestyle, our choices, our thoughts, our emotions, what we eat, our social interactions actually modulate the uh, genome and cause changes in gene expression. Earlier, it was believed that it was only when there were variations in the DNA, it could result in changes in gene expression. And these variations in the DNA were the raw material for evolution, but on the downside caused disease and even certain cancers. However, now we know that we can change the output or the expression or the behavior of our genes by our lifestyle and our choices and by our thoughts. So this information is really empowering and it leaves us with a huge responsibility, a responsibility that we can change the behavior of our genome. And if so, good habits can positively impact our epigenome and unhealthy choices like smoking, drinking, having a lot of fast food can actually switch on gene programs which are detrimental to health. And these gene programs actually can ultimately result in autoimmune diseases and cancer. But on the contrary, if you follow a healthy lifestyle, like for example, if you adopt yoga as a daily practice, you can actually switch on gene programs, which are actually can promote health, prevent the onset of complex lifestyle diseases. It has tremendous rehabilitative potential. And in addition to that, it can also be used as a powerful adjunct in the management of many diseases. So we now, it's been said that we always blame our genes for the diseases that we suffer. And uh, you know, we say that these are running in our families, but it's important to know that we are modulating the expression by our different behaviors, like our psychological state, our social interactions. And therefore, and the most important thing to remember is that these changes are transmitted through the germ cells. And therefore, we must treat our epigenome kindly because we are not only determining our health, but that of our children and great grandchildren, because these are heritable. So why has there been such a huge increase in the incidence of these diseases? Initially, it was believed that because of the pollutants, there was a large number of mutations, but now we know that our genome is highly stable. And there has been a large increase in the huge increase in the incidence of these complex lifestyle diseases because of various factors operating, which are modulating the epigenome. Firstly, there has been a rapid change in our lifestyle. We have moved from a hunter-gatherer society to a society which is largely sedentary, a society which is really dependent on fast food, food which is highly processed, highly refined, rich in trans fats, salts, and sugars, which has resulted in a huge increase, a steep increase in the incidence of these complex lifestyle diseases, be it cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, infertility, 
and even uh, autoimmune diseases. And these diseases have actually resulted in accelerated aging by causing oxidative stress. And this has also led to these diseases which used to set in at around 55 to 65 to 75 years occurring in even hypertension occurring in children less than 10 years and cardiovascular diseases and strokes occurring in people as young as 20 to 25 years. I just would like to just begin by giving you an example. We believe that cancer is a genetic disease, but it's important to know that the genes play a very small role. It's actually an unhealthy lifestyle, the diet, and various unhealthy practices like consumption of tobacco in any form, alcohol, obesity, which are the major players because they modulate the epigenome and switch on gene programs which cause chronic inflammation. So, but before that, I would just like to highlight that yes, there are genes and the mutations of those genes are highly penetrant, means that if you have a mutation, you do develop the disease. But in all the other cases, the genes will just increase your risk or susceptibility to develop the disease and are not causal. So be it any complex disease, like I told you, cancer, autoimmune disease, glaucoma, unexplained male factor infertility, rheumatoid arthritis or any other autoimmune disease or even depression, they have some common shared underlying mechanisms. They are chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, a condition in which there is an imbalance in the free radical, the high free radical levels and lower levels of antioxidant, chronic uh, activation of the sympathetic nervous system. There is dysbiosis or, and the reduced diversity of the gut microbiome. And this occurs largely because of uh, stress uh, and a high amount of refined processed foods, persistent activation of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, there is enhanced apoptosis, there is a dysregulation of the immune system, high levels of stress, anxiety, and depression, which also culminates in oxidative stress and results in accelerated biological age. So our biological age is much more than our chronological age, and this results in dysregulated gene uh, expression by modulating the epigenome. So these are the shared underlying mechanisms which cause complex diseases, and it's important to know that no modality in modern medicine can actually target each of these factors. And I'll just show you by a few examples that we are working on and how yoga can impact each of these underlying factors. So there was an article in Archives on Internal Medicine which said that healthy living is the best revenge. So what is yoga? So yoga is an experiential science which is actually a profound science of well-being. It actually helps in, uh, it is a set of practices which unites the uh, body, mind, and the spirit, and it consists of asanas, pranayam, as well as meditation. I would like to mention here that we consider yoga to be synonymous with asanas, but asanas just comprise of about 1.5 to 2 percent of yoga. The main benefits occur due to meditation. So, yo uh, so our yoga is not synonymous with exercise. And the main benefits of meditation is because it results in an enhanced state of awareness in a non-judgmental way. And all this was put together by uh, Maharishi Patanjali about 5,000 years ago in the Yoga Sutras. And I would like to mention here that yoga has profound effects. We all know that it causes enhanced physical efficacy. There's increase in the range of movement, flexibility, neuromuscular coordination. It causes mental equanimity, emotional resilience, and integration. It results in enhanced mind-body awareness, and when you read deeper states of meditation, it helps you to understand the real purpose and the meaning of life. But these are just, for example, the benefits that we see in medicine are just the side effects which you see are because of yoga. And it's important to know that when I talk of yoga today, I discuss of, oh, I mean, I, our patients are actually doing all these three modalities, that is asanas, pranayam, as well as meditation. So the first thing that I'm going to be talking of today is unexplained male factor infertility. In the recent decades, there has been a very rapid decline in the male reproductive health, along with an increase in the incidence of genitourinary abnormalities and testicular cancer and gonadal cancers occurring in the reproductive age group. And this rapid decline in the male reproductive health has resulted in a huge increase in the incidence of male factor infertility. And it's important to know that male factor is actually responsible for half the cases. And usually the problem is blamed to the female, but it's the male which is actually responsible in half the cases. And majority of these couples go in for assisted conception. 
Now, the sperm DNA damage is the single largest cause of defective sperm function. And it's important to know that if you use the assisted uh, conception technology in one generation, you are going to need this more in the second generation because you're transmitting the sperm with the damaged DNA. So today I talk of unexplained male factor infertility in which they have everything normal as per WHO guidelines. They have a normal count, motility, and morphology. Now in these cases, we have found that they have high levels of seminal oxidative stress and DNA damage and our unhealthy lifestyle like smoking, alcohol consumption, excessive use of cell phone, depression, high intake of fast food, excessive use of non-veg food is because of the buildup of endocrine disrupting chemicals and exposure to phthalates and environmental pollutants actually has resulted in high levels of seminal oxidative stress and DNA damage. There are studies which have shown beyond doubt that high consumption of non-veg food actually results in increased levels of these endocrine disrupting chemicals which can disrupt the testicular development resulting in low sperm counts and genitourinary abnormalities. So our studies, this is summed up in this paper, uh, which shows that lifestyle factors, unhealthy social habits, advanced paternal age, psychological stress results in oxidative stress. This oxidative stress damages both the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA. It results in shorter telomeres, so we believe that infertility is accelerated testicular aging. It results in the buildup of these oxidative DNA adducts, which is 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, which results in both mutations as well as epimutations. And this actually, because the sperm has a highly compact nucleus, it, and it has a highly truncated repair mechanism and is transcriptionally and translationally silent, the transmission of this DNA damage to the offspring, if such sperms are used for fertilization, results in not only congenital malformations, recurrent spontaneous abortions, dominant genetic diseases, complex neuropsychiatric disorders like autism, schizophrenia, childhood depressions, and even childhood cancers. And they have given rise to the concept of paternal origin of health and disease. So to combat seminal oxidative stress and DNA damage, WHO advocates that we should have five servings of fruits and vegetables. And the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine advocates that we should have 10 servings of fruits and vegetables. And who in India can actually afford this? So our studies have shown that a high percentage of men with primary, secondary infertility or recurrent spontaneous abortions have high free radical levels. So they experience oxidative stress. And we have quantified the DNA damage by seeing the by comet assay as well as by sperm chromatin structure assay. You can see here in the control panel that you have majority of the fluorescence, which is restricted to the region of the head, showing you good quality DNA versus the cases here in the infertile cases where there is majority of the migration of the DNA in the region of the tail showing that the DNA is fragmented. Here using acridine orange, as a, which is a metachromatic dye, here each, here each dot actually represents the sperm and the number of sperm seen towards the x-axis represents the damaged DNA and the ones towards the y-axis, the good quality DNA. And you can see as compared to the controls, in the infertile cases, the large number of sperms are found towards the X axis showing high levels of DNA damage. And this has been done by flow cytometry using a technique known as sperm chromatin structure assay. We also find that, as I told you, we consider that infertility is accelerated testicular aging and, we, uh, and very low and very high levels of free radicals results in shorter telomeres. And these shorter telomeres, which are flanking the ends of the chromosomes, they undergo rapid atresia with oxidative stress because they are guanine rich repeats and they are the targets of oxidative stress. And in addition to that, we find that a number of key repair, though the DNA repair mechanism is highly truncated, but few enzymes are active and we find that majority of them are found at very low levels in infertile men. So we also quantified the level of this base, which I told you induces both mutations and epimutations. And we find that with unhealthy habits like smoking, alcohol consumption, and exposure to insecticides and pesticides, when they are doing intensive gardening for more than three generations, they have high levels of oxidative DNA damage. We also quantified the level of this uh, oxidative DNA adduct in fathers of children who had sporadic cancers. So there are two cancers which have been found higher in children with fathers who have gone in for assisted conception, and one of them is retinoblastoma. 
So we actually picked up cases which are non-hereditary, the cases are non-familial, just to see that why the, uh, why the children have developed retinoblastoma, what is the quality of the sperm DNA. And we actually find that they had high level of sperm DNA. You can look at the father's sperm DNA as compared to the men who had healthy children. And you can find that they had high levels of this base, which induces de novo germline mutations and epi mutations. And we also quantified the level of this base in the children who had retinoblastoma. And you can see, as compared to the children who did not have uh, uh, cancer, the, uh, this uh, cancer of the retina, you find that the levels were significantly higher in these children, and this results in post-zygotic mutations. So what is actually done in cases with high levels of oxidative stress? They are given antioxidants. So we did a double-blind, placebo-controlled, uh, randomized uh, study, and we find that antioxidants, though they benefit the sperm motility and help it in fertilization, but there is really no change, no improvement in the DNA integrity. And majority of the antioxidants at therapeutic levels are not able to improve the DNA integrity except a few. And here I just wanted to show you that it was a sporadic cases which we uh, studied. And when you studied the father's sperm DNA quality, you can see that the oxidative stress levels were significantly higher. And also the mean DNA fragmentation index was higher than the control levels. So now I'll talk to you about the impact of yoga on the sperm genome and the epigenome. So we did quantify all the parameters pre and post intervention. Now oxidative stress actually showed an improvement within 10 days, but the DNA damage takes about uh, six months to show about two spermatogenic cycles to show significant improvement. You can see that there has been a significant decline in the free radical levels. There has been a decline in the levels of oxidative adducts. Because this is a psychosomatic disease, the stress levels are very high. So you can see the cortisol levels have gone down and so the levels of various inflammatory cytokines which increase when you have unhealthy social habits. And you can also see that this is showing you the total antioxidant capacity. You can see that you were told to have 10 servings of fruits and vegetables to combat uh, the free radical levels, but yoga has caused upregulations of various genes which are coding for the antioxidants like catalase, superoxide, dismutase, glutathione peroxidase, and you can see that there is a significant increase in the total antioxidant capacities versus those groups which did not practice yoga. So this, these changes in gene expression are occurring because of the action of yoga on the epigenome. In addition to that, ours, this was the first study to show that yoga can also influence the expression of the longevity genes, which are histone deacetylases, which are the sirtuins. And these sirtuins have been shown to be increased when you have 100 glasses of red wine because they increase the levels of resveratrol. But this was the first study to show that yoga, independent of intake of any red wine, actually caused an upregulation of the levels of sirtuins. We also find that there was a significant decline in the level of this base. As I told you, this is a marker of oxidative DNA damage, which induces both mutations as well as epi mutations. And you can see that post practice of yoga, there's a significant decline in the level of this base. And this is very, very important because this shows that this will not only decrease the incidence of tumors in the father, but it can also decrease the load of genetic as well as epigenetic diseases in the offspring. We also studied the telomerase activity, and this study showed that when you practice yoga, you can significantly increase the telomerase activity. Now, the telomere length is a complex trait. Its size actually is dependent on two major factors. One is the telomerase level and activity and the oxidative stress. And when there is high levels of oxidative stress and low telomerase activity, it actually results in accelerated aging. But we find that both those factors improve post-yoga and therefore you reduce the rate at which you are aging. We also studied the expression levels of various genes which are important for fertility as well as for early embryonic development. We did a microarray analysis and you can see that this is just showing you the fold chain. Uh, this, this is just showing you the CT value, showing you the change in the expression of genes. And you can see as compared to the controls post-practice of yoga, the levels are normalizing. We also studied by ELISA the levels of various markers. For example, methylation marks are one of the most important marks which are studied uh, when you are actually studying the epigenetic marks. And we know that when there is hypermethylation, there is silencing of genes and hypomethylation results in the overexpression of the genes. And it's important to understand that another major factor which dysregulates the epigenome is oxidative stress. 
and oxidative stress actually results in hypomethylation of the genome, making it unstable by exposing all the repetitive elements, the transposons and the retrotransposons. But in addition to that, it has been seen that it causes hypermethylation of certain genes which maintain genomic integrity. And we've found that when you practice yoga, as the oxidative stress declines, there's a reestablishment of the methylation marks by, you can see that the levels post-practice of yoga, the levels of methyl cytosine has actually increased. And as the oxidative stress declines, the levels of hydroxymethyl cytosine has gone down. In addition to that, this was the first study also to show that when you practice yoga, you can actually re-establish the methylation marks and it has profound impact on various genes uh, there, uh, which are methylated. And we found that there were a large number of genes which were showing differential methylation marks and a number of genes were hypomethylated which were critical for spermatogenesis, embryo implantation and early embryonic development. And those genes which enhance apoptosis which were dysregulating the blood flow, blood flow were hypermethylated. Now let's see the effect of, the, so this was the effect of yoga on the epigenome. And this is very important because these effects are going to be transmitted to the next generation resulting in healthy offsprings because of regulation of the methylation marks. And now see the effect on the genome. Now post practice of yoga, you can see that the number of dots which represent here the number of sperm with a, with a bad quality DNA, you can see that they have significantly declined post practice of yoga. So yoga is having a profound impact both on the genome as well as the epigenome. And now I'll talk of impact of yoga on an autoimmune disease that is rheumatoid arthritis. Now, rheumatoid arthritis is a progressive, a very severe, crippling, painful arthritis, which affects not only the joints, but it also targets the, the brain, the heart, the lungs, as well as the skin and various other organ systems. And these were randomized controlled trials, which were done. And you can see that post, so there were two groups, one which was doing yoga, and they were also on the anti-rheumatic drugs. And there was a group which was only having disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. And you can see, so this was a yoga group, and you can see that post-practice of yoga, there was a significant decline in the disease activity score as compared to the group that was not doing yoga. You can also see that because this is a very severe, painful arthritis, and it is progressive, and there's reduced quality of life because it is dependent on other individuals, and you find that there is a high level of comorbidity. And by the bed depression inventory, you can see that there's been a significant decline in the severity of depression in the cases which practice yoga. Now to understand why there is a change and why is there a decrease in the disease activity score, we started a panel of inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines. You can see that acute phase reactions like CRP have shown a significant decline post-practice of yoga. In addition to that, interleukin 17A, which is responsible the articular symptoms, the interleukin-6, which causes the extra-articular symptoms in the heart, brain, lungs, it shows a significant decline post-practice of yoga, whereas the group that did not practice did not show any significant change. Tumor necrosis factor, which upregulates the downstream genes like NF-kappa B and a host of other factors which causes synovial hyperplasia, osteoclast proliferation, and bone erosion, has shown a significant decline post-practice of yoga. So yoga helps to re-establish immunological tolerance. In addition to studying these inflammatory cytokines, we also studied a panel of anti-inflammatory cytokines like transforming growth factor beta, and you can see that the anti-inflammatory cytokines show an upregulation. We also had cases which had insertion deletion polymorphism. So this, these were cases which in this, the uh, rheumatoid arthritis was running in families. Despite the presence of the susceptibility genotypes, you can see that post-practice of yoga, the level of this non-classical HLA-G molecule has gone up. Now, these findings are very, very important. It shows that even if these problems are running in your families, if you practice yoga, you could have very mild symptoms or you can delay the onset or you may not even have the problem if you regularly practice yoga. Bioflow cytometry, we also studied the level of various, for example, the, as I told you, inflammatory cytokine 17 is produced by these T helper 17 cells, and you can see that the population of these cells has gone down significantly post-practice of yoga, and whereas the cells which are actually maintaining immune homeostasis, the level, the T regulatory cells, they go up. So yoga helps to maintain homeost immune homeostasis, and the increase in the levels of HLAG helps to uh, maintain, get into molecular remission. 
So as I told you, there are some common players in any complex disease. So I just wanted to show you that oxidative stress and oxidative DNA damage and a reduced antioxidant capacity is uh, occurring in, in this disorder also. And there is decrease in the oxidative stress and oxidative DNA damage. So how, how is oxidative stress decreasing? Because mitochondria are both the source and targets of free radicals. We studied the mitochondrial integrity and mitochondrial integrity is low. But post practice of yoga, you find that there's a significant increase in the mitochondrial membrane potential showing that there is an improvement in the mitochondrial integrity. And this is the first study to show the impact of yoga on the mitochondrial integrity. And this has a lot of implications in various mitochondrial diseases. We also studied various genes which maintain the mitochondrial integrity and help in mitochondrial replication as well as transcription as well as in biogenesis. And we find an upregulation again in the expression of these genes. And again, this is because of the impact on the epigenome. And this was the first study to show that it also increases the levels of this molecule, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. This is a molecule which helps to maintain the crosstalk between the nuclear and the mitochondrial DNA, and the levels decline with aging. And with an upregulation in this level, it also helps to uh, enhance the mitochondrial and nuclear DNA crosstalk, which helps to uh, improve the oxidative phosphorylation and enhances the ATP production. So these findings are really critical because they not only delay aging, but they also help to enhance the functional capacity of all the organ systems in the body. In addition to that, we have st started studying a number of other diseases like head of optic atrophy, as well as Leber's hereditary optic uh, neuropathy, which in which you have uh, you know, middle-aged people are developing acute blindness, acute or subacute blindness, and we've seen that they actually the deterioration in their vision stops post-practice of yoga because of improvement in the mitochondrial integrity. So now I'll just give you another example that is glaucoma. Now it was believed that glaucoma is a disease in which the only modifiable risk factor was an increase in the intraocular pressure. But various studies have shown that again, there are common players like inflammation, hypoxia, reduced levels of various factors which promote neuroplasticity because of which there is enhanced retinal ganglion cell death. There is dysregulation of the blood flow. And our studies both on the blood as well as on the trabecular meshwork have shown that there is increase in the expression levels of various genes which are increasing the blood flow like nitric oxide sulfate one and three, which enhance the blood flow in the retina. There is an increased expression of various genes which are here, which are anti-inflammatory. There's increased expression of various genes which are promoting neuroplasticity, which are like fertilizers for these retinal ganglion cells, which are helping to, and they, uh, which are helping to, for the survival of these, uh, and helping for the growth of these retinal ganglion cells. Various factors which are inflammatory, which are impeding the aqueous outflow, actually show down regulation post practice of yoga. And after publication of this article in the American Journal of Ophthalmology, now meditation has been made as a part of the standard protocol for treatment of primary open angle glaucoma. In addition to that, as well, it was it has been now reported that glaucoma is a neurodegenerative disease which occurs because of reduced cerebral blood flow. And our study has shown that meditation enhances the brain oxygenation, increasing the, by increasing the blood flow, and it also increases the level of various factors which promote neuroplasticity, like brain-derived neurotrophic factors. And again, these were randomized controlled trials. Now I'll talk of depression. And as I, what I was talking of earlier was comorbid depression. This is major depressive disorder that I talk of now. And you can see here that India is one of the most depressed countries. And it's important to know that there is a 33% increase in the diagnosis of depression in the last three years. And again, these were randomized controlled trials. And you can see that in gray are the group which practice yoga. And in black are the groups that did not practice yoga. And you can see that there's a significant decline in the severity of depression, depression post practice of yoga. Now, why did this occur? This occurred because when these people practice yoga, there was an increase in the expression levels of various factors. These are the neurofactors that promote neuroplasticity. And these are very, very important findings because this shows that not only you are changing the brain physiology, the brain biochemistry, but you're actually altering the brain anatomy. And it has been seen that for brain, the size actually matters. And it's very, very important to understand that when you actually practice yoga, you can actually increase the amount of gray matter in certain areas. For example, in the hippocampus, which is a seat for emotional regulation, learning, and memory, you increase the size of 
uh, the prefrontal cortex, which is the site for cognition, decision making, you increase the size of the temporal occipital junction just above the ear, which is a site for executive, uh, this empathy, compassion. And why are these occurring? Because of increase in the level of variance factors, which are promoting the crosstalk between various neurons, promoting synaptogenesis. And you can see here that in these cases, there's an increase in the levels of brain derived neurotrophic factor and DHA. Now, decline in the serotonin levels actually result in, results in depression, and the most commonly sold drugs in the market are the serotonin analogs, these antidepressant drugs, and you can see just by practice of yoga, the serotonin levels are increasing. In addition to that, people who have depression, they have an altered sleep uh, cycles because of lower melatonin levels, and we see that post-practice of yoga, the melatonin levels increase. Again, melatonin is also a very potent antioxidant, and the highest levels of melatonin are found in mitochondria. So this also helps in maintaining the mitochondrial integrity. And because the sleep-wake sleep cycle is restored, this also helps in normalizing the hormonal milieu. And here I would just like to add that since uh, uh, yoga is actually improving uh, your uh, factors which are promoting neuroplasticity, Yoga should be practiced by one and all. We don't really need to develop a disease to start practicing yoga. If all of us practice yoga, we can actually enhance our learning, memory, cognition, competence, ourselves. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we can help better mental equanimity, uh, emotional resilience because of increasing the various factors which are promoting the, the, the causing the we are helping to modulate and cause changes in the brain architecture depending upon the stimuli. In addition to that. Well, I wanted to tell you, like, as I told you, there are some common players. The inflammatory levels go down, the stress hormone levels go down, cortisol. And cortisol is a player which actually causes a decrease in the factors, the neuroplasticity factors. It also causes activation of the sympathetic nervous system and a decline in these levels causes a decline in the, and prevents the, and reduces the sizes of the amygdala, which is for which increases when there's a lot of fear, fright, and also stress. And you can see that the levels of cortisol has gone down. Now, people who have stress, anxiety, and depression, they age much faster. And studies have shown that, that they have higher biological age as compared to the chronological age. And we have seen that because there is decrease in the inflammation, there is an upregulation in the sirtuins, and also decrease in the oxidative stress levels, and the telomere length is maintained, you can actually slow down the rate at which you are aging. And a number of genes, so we did a microarray, and we can find a number of genes which are helping to maintain the circadian rhythm and the genes which are maintaining genomic integrity actually are increased post practice of uh, yoga. And irrespective of the genotype, we found that about 60% cases show remission post practice of yoga versus just 33% who are on antidepressant. And all four domains of quality of life show an improvement post practice of yoga. And just to sum up, I wanted to show you that millions of dollars are being spent to develop drugs or cosmetics to look younger. But what is the use of look, having a longer life when you don't have a healthy lifespan? So, but uh, what yoga is achieving is not only it is helping you to live longer by enhancing the expression of longevity genes, but it also is enhancing the expression levels of various factors by decreasing oxidative stress, by promoting neuroplasticity, by decreasing various the levels of inflammation. It prevents the onset of complex lifestyle diseases and delays their onset delays the onset of dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinsonism. So not only are you having a longer lifespan, but you're also having a longer health span. So we see that yoga actually modulates the internal pharmacy. It targets all the factors which are actually key players in complex lifestyle diseases, like it decreases stress, anxiety, depression, regulates the epigenome, decreases the level of auto oxidative and mitochondrial nuclear DNA damage, regulates blood flow, maintains immune homeostasis, decreases the level of enhanced apoptosis, causes parasympathetic dominance, helps to maintain telomere length, so reduces our biological age, and decreases inflammation. So thus, I would just like to sum up by telling you that yoga has tremendous transformative power because it actually causes changes in the epigenome and switches on gene programs which are beneficial for us. So we know that our epigenome influences our health. We too can influence our epigenome by practicing yoga. So yoga's benefits extend far beyond just physical self-efficacy, mental self-efficacy, and mental equanimity. And it, but by, but it also enhances 
your mind-body awareness and has such a tremendous impact because it not only promotes health, prevents the onset of diseases, it has tremendous rehabilitative power and can act as a powerful adjunct in the management of complex diseases. Thank you. Any questions? I request chairpersons to give the remarks. Uh, ma'am, it's Mr. Rajan here, ma'am. Um, uh, thank you for your very clear and uh, neat presentation. Uh, and actually, it's eye opener for me, madam. Actually, you made it very clear that uh, the yoga is not a synonym for the uh, my exercise. So, I, I know from my childhood, I always have a aversion on the exercise yoga because of the, it's, it's uh, related to the exercise. That's the feeling I have. But now you made me very clearly understand that this, the um, yoga is not exercise. So definitely I'll be moving towards ex uh, yoga from here after. And um, you made very clearly about that uh, our unhealthy lifestyles, uh, choices, social habit, dysfunctional eating habits, and environmental pollut pollutants have lead to more to rise in complex diseases. And also you are uh, you made very clear to understand that how a simple lifestyle intervention like yoga can impact our health by impact of the epigenomidum. Thank you for your very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to thank you for your wonderful illumination, which you have explained nicely. I can't hear you. Your voice is cracking. The signal is poor, sir. There is some Professor Guha, sir, your bandwidth is poor, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. V, I could see that uh, his bandwidth is not there, actually. Uh, uh, by the time we can take a few questions, which are there in the chat box. Uh, I have a question, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, I just yes, wanted to know that can, can depression be... Uh, treated by this cognitive behavioral therapy only, ma'am? Yeah, that's a very good question, Dr. Ravi. Actually, depression is not just a disease of the brain. It's not just a disease of the mind. It's a mind-body disease. And when a person has depression, it affects every system of the body. So cognitive behavioral therapy is useful. But yoga targets both the mind and the body because the body acts as a whole. When you are having various chemicals which are being produced, which are increased like cortisol, it is affecting every organ system of the body. So it's ideal to actually treat it by yoga, which is going to target every organ system, whereas cognitive behavioral therapy will just target your mind. So ideally, it should be treated by yoga. Okay. Uh, actually, whenever I used to discuss with you, ma'am, regarding this... Uh guest lecture you always used to mention about the yoga right that we should have a guest lecture on that yeah Today, i'm passionate about it you know <laughs> yeah means but uh, you changed my perception completely today ma'am the way uh, you delivered the lecture and it was very enlightening thank you so much ma'am thank you so much thank you thank you Ushma, can we go ahead and, and take up some questions? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jyoti has written it's a very elaborative research, ma'am. Very useful. Wanted to ask, uh, by yoga, do you mean yoga, exercise, or pranayama? For how much duration daily and for how long it should be done to get the desired effect? That's a very important question. When I talk of yoga, we are meaning asanas, pranayama, as well as meditation. Uh, if you just do asanas, it's like any other exercise. And as I told you, the asanas just comprise of less than 2% of yoga. And the main purpose of asana, that is the main in your Patanjali Yoga Sutra, it says Thiram Sukham Asana. The main purpose of asanas is just to bring the body in perfect geometry so that you can breathe more effectively. Your spine is having its normal curvature. Your chest can expand for effective pranayama. And so whenever I talk of yoga, it is asanas, pranayama, and meditation. And when we do meditation, we make them do with the awareness of breathing. Now, in the US, there's a very important concept. They say three, six, five. They say do it three times a day, six breaths per minute, 
and do it for at least five minutes because they always adopt something like, you know, you have like a pill TDS. So they have started saying three, six, five, three times a day, six breaths per minute and do it for five minutes. So it's very, very important that we actually practice it daily. For example, if one day you are doing sitting asanas, you do the sitting ones, but along with pranayama and meditation, one day you do the standing ones, forward, backward bending, one day you do prone and other is on the back, but do with pranayama as well as meditation. And just like you practice dental hygiene, and you do not leave home without doing your brush, brushing your teeth. Similarly, we must practice yoga daily. Even a small practice can have such profound implications. But it was mind boggling where because even we were so amazed of people who had one problem, their other multiple problems were improving. improving. So a thing which is uh, India's gift to the whole world a thing which is ca causing such immense benefit. And now during the age of COVID, when you are told not to go out, you can practice yoga in the confines of your home. The only thing is when some, if you have some health issue, you can just take the advice of a trained yoga instructor. For example, if you have BP, they tell you to do the Pal Bharti very, very gently, not doing forward bending postures. So if you have any issues, you first take the help of a trained instructor, learn everything, but practice it daily. There are such health benefits which are, you know, which are going to improve every organ system. And, you know, so I think it is such a benefit that one must uh, integrate it into their lifestyle. Uh, next we have, uh, does meditation increase the oxygenation of brain or uh, pranayama helps in that? Yeah, actually, when we when I say meditation, we are actually uh, focusing on the breath. And uh, initially, the stages are like first you do Kapal Bharti to remove all the uh, carbon dioxide, and then you do Anlom Vilom, in which you are breathing slowly and deeply. Now, what happens? And nasal mucosa has a lot of these uh, receptors, nerve receptors, and these are directly linked to the limbic system and may various parts of the brain. And now it's been shown beyond doubt by putting intracranial EEGs. Uh, by intracranial electrodes that when you uh, do meditation as well as deep breathing, breathing through the nose, not through the mouth, it has an impact on various parts of the brain. So you have, so it is the levels, it causes an increase in the oxygenation levels and also increases the blood flow. Uh, next we have, uh, which part or type of yoga will help in depression and also help in change in the neurotransmitter levels in brain? Now, when people have depression, we try to make them do more of active uh, practices, like that is asanas, as compared meditation is for a very short duration initially, because when you leave them just to uh, sit in silence, their mind starts wandering. So we tell them to do more of these active practices like Surya Namaskar and, and also breathing practices. So that will help to increase the level of these neurotransmitters. Okay, then. Uh, the have studies been done as to which type of meditation have better outcome. Also, are there studies showing that uh, meditation has changes in the arterial dimension of the brain sub blood supply? Oh yes, there are numerous studies. There are studies by Sarah Lazar's group in uh, Harvard Medical School, which has she has shown beyond doubt that how various parts, and they have done, as our studies also in functional MRI have shown an increase in brain oxygenation and blood flow to the occipital cortex, especially in cases with uh, glaucoma. And Sarah Lazar's group has shown that increase in blood flow to the hippocampus, dented gyrus, in the increase in blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, sensory and award processing centers actually increases post-practice of uh, yoga. And, you know, when you do meditation, there are different types, but the main aim is that you have to, uh, you know, first close your eyes so that all your sensory, uh, you know, the external sensory uh, interference is released and then focus on your breathing. And when you do that, uh, you know, it is difficult initially, but once you start doing asanas, pranayama, you do become, you come into a meditative state. And But the main thing is do it regularly and you will see the changes. Okay. Thank you for sharing your valuable work, Dr. Vima. Have you also reported impact of yoga on psychosocial and behavioral disorders like hyperactivity or autism spectrum. Uh, could you also tell which meditation technique was used in your studies? Yeah, as I told you, we are doing, uh, this is Raj Yoga in which you do this with focus on breathing. Yeah, we have not actually, so one of my students is now working on the effect on childhood depression, uh, but we have uh, seen that there is an impact uh, of uh, yoga in autism. Because, and again, for that, the most important thing is that you have to have 
a trained instructor who can maintain, you know, this, uh, the because the, these people mainly have difficulties in maintaining social contact and eye contact, a trained instructor, and especially we try to train the parents. And recently I delivered a talk actually for these parents of autistic children and we highlighted to them that first the parents should do it so that the child will develop seeing the parents because there are mirror neurons, they will ape whatever the parents are doing. Not only will this help to improve the social interaction with the child, but it will also enhance, help to have better communication skills. So you can follow any form of yoga that is Raj Yoga and Hatha Yoga. And I would again like to emphasize that yoga transcends all barriers of age, caste, creed, religion. If you have a disability, you don't have a disability, acute or chronic pain. In yoga, Hat Pradipika it says that everyone can practice yoga. And it has such a profound impact on health. So I really advocate that everyone should do it, one who has a disease and one who doesn't have a disease. Next we have do yoga helps in combating pregnancy related ailments. Yes, it definitely does. And uh, though we have not worked on it, we have worked on um, infertility, we have worked on uh, different spontaneous uh, uh, abortions, and we worked on early pregnancy losses. Uh, but recently, we were thinking of beginning studies on uh, some other factors also, because we've, been, we've seen that uh, loss of mitochondrial integrity results in premature ovarian failure. And because we found an improvement in the mitochondrial integrity, this would also profoundly impact the quality of the oocytes that are being produced, which would also help in better pregnancy rates. And uh, you had mentioned that uh, now American Ophthalmology Association has incorporated yoga as an adjunct to standard treatment modality. Who can guide us or uh, where from we can have guidance to incorporate yoga as adjunct therapy? Uh, I would just like to mention here a little bit, uh, it's important again that it should be done under a trained instructor. Actually, they, in AIMS, there is a booklet they give because when you do Kapal Bharti forcibly and you do forward bending postures, your blood pressure and the intraocular pressure actually increases. So in these individuals, we tell them to do unlong and we tell them to do meditation, just focusing on breath. Please, they should not be doing any yoga without uh, counselor taking the help of a trained instructor because doing it wrong could increase the intraocular pressure. So they should be very careful. Kapal Bharti should not be done forcibly, done very, very gently followed by a nomolom and then with pranaya and then with the uh, focus on breathing. Thank you so much, ma'am. And you have got many compliments. Many have written wonderful deliberation, excellent presentation. Thank it's you. an eye opener. So many things. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Is it audible now? Yes, yes. yes. Hello. Yes, sir, you are audible. Audible? Yes, yes sir. Uh, yeah. Um, Ma'am, for the wonderful presentation, you have almost covered all the points. Just I have got little query that uh, the way yoga impacts the genome and epigenome, is it the same way the meditation also affects because yoga in involves some mechanical movements and meditation involves the molecules of silence, inner silence. So what is the basic difference of the two on uh, the effect of epigenetic uh, reprogramming? Prima, you are not audible. I'm not audible. Uh, yeah, yeah, now. Yeah, what I would like to say is that meditation is an integral part of yoga. When we talk of yoga, we don't speak of asanas alone. Asanas right. are a very small part. You have to do pranayama and meditation. And various molecules, you know, the Israeli scientists found out that there was a molecule that is released during meditation, which is known as anandamide, which is the molecule of bliss. So all these factors are helping. So where whatever changes are occurring, for example, it is believed that asanas are the hardware, whereas meditation is the software. So you have to do all three of them, not one alone. Okay, ma'am. And is there any effect on the modification of the small non-coding RNAs also through yoga? Yes, uh, the fact that it is acting on the uh, the fact that it is acting on the epigenome, it is acting on the non-coding. The non-coding regions of the genome are the ones which are having the regulatory elements. So the epigenetic marks are established by different mechanisms. One is the methylation marks. 
One are by acetylation marks and sumylation, phosphorylation, and the others are by microRNA and the non-coding DNA, which we call the junk DNA. But these have regulatory elements, and these they, there is a profound impact on those elements because of which there is a change in the expression levels. Okay, and the last question, ma'am, uh, is there any rule of the sensor protein present in the cell membrane, uh, which may be affected through yoga? And it can bring forward the change further in gene expression. So what? Can you just repeat it? I didn't get. What did you say in the beginning? Is there any way the yoga modifies the sensor proteins present in the cell membrane, which again brings about the changes in the gene expression? Oh yes. So there are numerous changes which have been reported in the proteins on the cell membrane as well as on the nuclear membrane, as well as on the various receptors which are present on the cell membrane. And uh, there are uh, various studies which have uh, numerous studies have documented that there are changes which are occurring in the cell membrane which are activating signal transduction pathways, and then they are bringing more changes in the gene expression. Yes, there are. Thank you very much, ma'am, for this uh, enriching my knowledge and enlightening all of us Thank to you. this wonderful collaboration. Okay. Dr. Pushpa, please. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Ravi, please enable me to share the screen. Sure, ma'am. So for this uh, very wonderful presentation, in this year, I would like to felicitate the speaker by this virtual video. Please accept our felicitation and momentum, ma'am. So we also would like to thank our eminent chairpersons for chairing the session. Uh, please accept our felicitations, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm feeling really honored and humbled. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ranjit Guhasar and Dr. Rajan sir for chairing the session. And uh, I would like to mention uh, the man behind this video, so Dr. Viveka, our associate editor. All credits to him. And uh, now I request uh, Dr. Kumar Satish Ravi to have any remarks, concluding remarks. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for giving me the chance to chair this wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pushpa. So once again, a very good evening to one and all. And I hope uh, you all had a very enlightening and uh, enriched sessions. And uh, I, I feel that you people have thoroughly enjoyed the guest lectures. And that can be uh, uh, said because of the question and session you can say, right? Uh, it, even the question says, uh, answer session, it was uh, a very broad, aspect we covered in the, you say, the question and answer session. And as mentioned by our eminent speaker, I can say that 
this anatomy is one of the basic sciences and the cornerstone for medical education. And yes, uh, when, when we talk about the child, as the child starts its education by learning the first letter, either you say A or in Hindi we say A, right? So similarly, when we talk about the budding doctors, uh, this initiates either you say his or her journey by learning anatomy. So it is no doubt that a sound knowledge of anatomy is essential, very much essential for a skillful surgeon or an efficient physician. And uh, rightly mentioned by this uh, Professor Sudha ma'am, uh, who said that it is very essential in you say the day to day life. So, but uh, over a period of time when we talk, uh, right, unfortunately it is being called as uh, the non-clinical su subject or we say the pre-clinical subject and uh, for the limited scope uh, for the growth in the career, you say. So it raises some of the questions whether uh, anatomists are losing their glory. So keeping those things in mind, uh, this NJCA is uh, trying to focus the main objective of the research. Uh, I mean to say to explore the unknown and unlock uh, the new responsibilities. And keeping this only in our mind, we organize this webinar uh, particularly this webinar, which, which was on research in anatomical sciences. And that too, you say during such uh, crucial time, uh, it is timely uh, decision taken by the Society of Clinical Anatomists and you say the members of the National Journal of Clinical Anatomists who decided uh, to organize or to observe this uh, World Anatomy Day so as to uh, bring all the clinical anatomists under one platform and to have uh, this grand academic feast, you can say. And also enlighten the young minds, or you say the budding anatomists regarding the various aspects of uh, research opportunities from uh, distinguished researchers from uh, either you, India or you say the abroad. And we are overwhelmed by the wonderful response, uh, what we got from the uh, anatomy fraternity from all over the country. And I think almost uh, more than 1500 or around 2000 uh, uh, registrations were there, right? And uh, when we talk about this Dr. Sudha ma'am, it is our immense pride that uh, uh, Dr. Sudha Sesen ma'am was the chief guest for this program. And it is our proud privilege to have her blessings on this day, that is the World Anatomy Day, who is being an anatomist, uh, a great inspiration for you say the young achievers or the sprouting or the budding anatomists and very rightly professor sudha ma'am mentioned that anatomy rules and i don't understand so many times i've mentioned that i don't understand how anyone can be an anatomist and not to be uh, proud of it and i feel that there is a lot to do in this field right and this webinar was possible because of the constant support of and encouragement of our uh, dynamic president, uh, this professor M. C. Kumar sir, and under the able guidance of uh, Dr. Muthu Kumar Vail sir, who is the general secretary, and uh, Dr. Kavi Mani, treasurer of the Society of Clinical Anatomists, and all the office bearer of the Society of Clinical Anatomists, and the esteemed editorial board members of the National Journal of Clinical Anatomy, and of course, uh, the world-class publisher, that is the Walters Clover, who has always been there to support us whenever uh, we wanted any kind of help, they uh, blended their support uh, without any condition or you can say the unconditional support they provided to us. Uh, this uh, words uh, shortfall uh, to express my deepest uh, gratitude to our uh, dear Professor Shanitabs, right? Uh, as I said that in spite of uh, his busy schedule, even after uh, postponing the previous webinar, which was uh, scheduled uh, during this COVID time, but because so many members of the editorial board were suffering from this COVID-19, so we had to postpone, right? So still again, when we requested him and he very politely and humbly he accepted our invitation and uh, he delivered this lecture, which was uh, uh, liked by one and all. I'm also, uh, I wish to sincere acknowledgement to our dear Professor Arima Dada ma'am for giving insight to such a relevant and apt topic you can say yoga uh, uh, you can say uh, this is the india is a country of yoga and rishikesh we say that it is one of the capital of yoga right 
and the topic was uh, that is the yoga which uh, the impact on genome and epigenome uh, it was uh, appreciated by one and all uh, that i said that that can be uh, illustrated by the question and session and i'm very proud to say that uh, our editorial board members and their uh, contribution in organizing this webinar has been magnanimous uh, the, uh, either you say the professor shanetov or the professor rima dada ma'am both are associated as the editorial board member of national journal of clinical anatomy so i hope the sessions on the reverse translational research is uh, very enlightening regarding the various research dimensions uh, available in anatomy similarly session on yoga which is an emerging area of research uh, for anatomist has motivated the audience uh, to prosper further you can say i am grateful to the legends of indian anatomy like professor paul sir professor t s rai sir and professor ranjit buhan professor t rajan sir for chairing uh, the session and accepting our request to chair uh, these two sessions and enlighten us by their in depth knowledge of anatomy most important is the support and love the members are uh, sharing on national journal of clinical anatomy and which inspires motivates and encourages us uh, to organize such kind of webinars and my special thanks to team of national journal of clinical anatomy especially to mention our budding anatomist my ref, uh, right and left hand i can say uh, dr viveka and dr pushpa apart from that dr rose dr apurva dr mohana dr adil and of course dr sankaran thank you all uh, for the eternal love and affection towards the national journal of clinical anatomy and looking forward for the same in future as well thank you thank you so much namaskar happy dashera to one and all and once again wish you all a very very happy world anatomy day thank you so much that's all from my side dr pushpa thank you so much sir now i would request dr rosemul to deliver the oath of thanks uh, thank you dr pushpa it's not happiness that brings us gratitude it's gratitude that brings us happiness honorable chief guest dr sudha sheshayan guest speakers dr shaintas and dr reema dada chairpersons soca office bearers editor in chief ngc ngca co members and all participants and well wishers out there wish you all a very pleasant evening on this world anatomy day it's such an honor for me to get the opportunity to thank each one of you on behalf of ngca under the aegis of soca and walters clover i extend my gratitude to our honorable chief guest dr sudha sheshayan to take out time from her busy schedule to grace this event Thank you, ma'am, for inspiring and encouraging us with your words on this very special day. I would like to thank the guest speakers, Dr. Shane Tufts and Rima Dada, for sharing their precious knowledge with all of us here today. Through reverse translational research in anatomy, Dr. Shane Tufts has beautifully narrated how cadaveric feasibility studies can influence patient care. Thank you, sir. Yoga impact on genome and epigenomics. by dr rima dada was really an enlightening session and how it determines the fate of reproductive outcome and health of offspring was really marvelous chairing a session has to be done by intelligent brains and we had professor g p pal professor t s roy professor ranjit guha and dr professor t rajan as our eminent chairpersons whose presence added a glow to the sessions next we have the pillars of society of clinical anatomists with us president dr shivakumar sir general secretary dr muthukumar revel sir and treasurer dr kavimani sir who were always there to support and motivate their brain child national journal of clinical anatomy thank you so much for being with us always this webinar was made available to all the participants by the generous support of our sponsors walters clover publishers without whom it would not have been easy to deliver an academic fiesta meeting international standards A great leader's courage to fulfill his vision comes from passion. There is no doubt about who is the master brain behind this webinar. It's none other than our ever vibrant editor in chief, Dr. Kumar Satish Ravi sir. It would have been impossible without your untiring efforts, sir. Thank you so much on behalf of all those who have gathered here for organizing a mind-blowing session. Ravi sir is of course lucky enough to have a wonderful team with Dr. Pushpa and Dr. Vivega, as you already mentioned, being his left and right, for managing the official matters of NJCA smoothly. 
and we also have Dr. Apurva, Dr. Adil, uh, Dr. Mohanapriya, Dr. Shankaran as an extended support system. A big thanks to you for being there throughout. Last but not the least, the delegates and well-wishers of this webinar, without you all, this session wouldn't have been a grand success. Once again, I thank each one of you from the bottom of my heart. Wish you all a very happy weekend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross. It was great. And you are also one of my hand, right? Thank you so Thank you, much. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the, uh, Mr. Ravi also for all the technical help uh, for making our work easy. And I wholeheartedly thank all of you for attending the webinar. Any more remarks? From Walter Kluwer, I would like to give my gratitude and thanks to all the SOCA and the Chemical Anatomy Society members. Thanks to Dr. Shane and Dr. Rima Dada, who has actually delivered a very nice lecture. It was actually uh, on the yoga, it was an eye opener for me also. That yes, uh, it's a quite an interesting fact that he has just told us. Uh, it's the first time that I've heard, uh, you know, uh, from Dr. Sudha Shishayan. Uh, it's a great thing to hear from uh, the Vice Chancellor of Tamil Nadu MJ University. Uh, yes, uh, uh, from Walter Stewart, uh, we promise to bring you such more webinars and more uh, elaborated sessions on different topics of anatomy and the other clinical subjects also. Uh, well, uh, last but not least, uh, happy to share it to all of you. And thank you so much for joining us and giving the opportunity to be part of this show. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mr. Ravi Shukla. I don't have words to express my gratitude. Right. Thank you so much. You have been immense support to us. Whenever we needed, you were there. Thanks a lot. And I, I must appreciate the complete team of the Walter School. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravi. So Goodbye to you all. Thanks so much. Subject. Anatomy is not a dead subject. See the boundaries of anatomy. So I will take the opportunity to ask or to request all the participants, junior participants, please in, increase your horizon of research, not only cutting the dead bodies is anatomy. Okay, see Dr. Rima, what she is doing. She is an anatomist, but her research is totally different and collaborate with the clinicians. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ravi and your team. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, sir. I request all the participants to please uh, give a feedback form because we will be providing Dr. Ravi and uh, Soka and Walter Snow will be providing the e-certificate to all the attendees of the session. So I request you please provide your e feedback on to the form that we have posted on the shared drive. So please go ahead with that. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank you, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Ravi. Happy weekend. Thank you. Happy to share. Good night to all. Thanks. Like this.